All right, everyone. Welcome to another really uh, good event um, that I've been looking forward to. It's really nice to uh, finally get together, actually sooner than we anticipated. So we have uh, one of those debates that's been going on for some time, actually, in the community. And today we will be discussing uh, the Protestant versus the Catholic canon. We actually have an official motion here, which is that um, the motion says the Old Testament canon only contains the 39 books listed in the Protestant canon. So, sorry, the Old Testament canon only contains the 39 books listed in the Protestant canon. And Anglican scholar and a good friend of mine, actually, I'm proud to say, <laughs> Jonathan Sheffield, will be arguing the affirmative, and Trent Horn will be affirming the um, the negative position and uh, we won't uh, vote for a winner but <laughs> I guess you guys can decide who did better but it's not about winning and losing Jonathan uh, please go ahead and um, you know you can introduce yourself but we have 15 minutes of an opening statement starting from you and again you hold the affirmative position all right let's go okay so you want me to start now on my opening yeah okay uh, let me bring up my screen real quick before we start the, the clock so let me just share real quick. All right, clock doesn't start until you uh, start talking. Right there. Okay. What is and is not canon in the history of the Greek, Latin, and Aramaic apostolic churches may well be a matter of debate among the magisterian. But such debate is of little use to the millions of Orthodox Jews in the synagogues of the world, of whose authority and testimony of its canonical tradition, there was almost certainly never really any doubt. Therefore, to open my dialogue with Mr. Horn, I would like to outline the intended plan of action while judiciously addressing today's question. First and foremost, my objective is to document the empirical standards by which to identify and define the canon of the Old Testament. After establishing this foundation, I will frame the decisions on the Old Testament canon reached at the councils of Rome, Hippo, and Carthage in its proper context in order to explain the purpose of the assembly and the underlying data and assumptions that guided them in affirming these canonical lists. Thirdly, I aim to bring attention to the overwhelming weight of empirical and testimonial evidence in support of the canon that has been independently handed down by the Hebrews and commonly received among their synagogues, as defined in the Anglican Church's 1562 39 Articles of Religion. In constructing an empirical framework to identify and define the Jewish canon, we first turn to St. Paul, who makes the empirical observation that the oracles of God were committed unto the Jews, thereby placing the Hebrews, not the Greeks, as the author authoritative appointed witnesses and guardians of the received texts of the Old Testament. Take notice of the fact that Paul did not appeal to the Septuagint as an exemplar of the Jewish canon, even though he could have, given his letters to the Corinthians and Romans, demonstrate clear knowledge of that version. Additionally, this is a standard followed by St. Jerome during his translation project of the Old Testament who advocated it was necessary to seek the single fountainhead and emphasized that whatever is not found among the Hebrews should be set aside and classified as apocryphal. Even Origen's pursuit of understanding the canon of the Old Testament began by appealing first to the writings handed down by the Hebrews. Secondly, to objectively identify the canonical writings, St. Augustine prescribes that we judge the records according to the following criterion to prefer those that are received by all the Catholic churches to those which some do not receive. Among those, again, which are not received by all, he will prefer such as has the sanction of the greater number and those of greater authority to such as are held by the smaller number and those of less authority. Augustine's full declaration provides us with two key takeaways. Firstly, this judgment is to be exercised on the whole canon of scripture. Secondly, his model to evaluate the question of canonicity introduces two principal concepts reflected in our Nicene formulas, i.e. Catholic and apostolic. To meet the criterion of being Catholic, 
the writing should be universally received among the relevant witnesses. To be apostolic is to trace back to its original jurisdiction through an unbroken chain of custody, which in this case would be the Jewish synagogues who established the transfer and control procedures to safeguard its text. To that end, the culmination of different synagogues across a wide geographical area provides an objective framework to examine the differences and consensus in the received text of the Hebrews. Tertullian employed a similar model in his two-part test against the heretics and applied the framework to evaluate Marcion's textual claims concerning Luke's gospel. By the same token, our objective standard is no different. Our final measure comes from Josephus, who provides historically significant testimony certifying that the Jewish canon was closed by 400 BC. He establishes this point in two parts. First, he surveyed the publication since the time of R.C. Xerxes, reporting that those writings had not been esteemed of the like authority with the former records. This was reiterated by the Jews, according to Jerome in his time whereby they objected to the writings of the Hellenistic period to include the story of Susanna, the Song of the Three Children, and the story of Bell and the Dragon, considering they are not found in the Hebrew volume. Augustine, in the City of God, makes the same observation, reinforcing that the Jewish writings from the time of the Second Temple down through the Maccabean line of Aristobulus were not classified as canonical by the Jews, especially as it relates to Maccabees. Second, Josephus makes an objective demonstration, calling attention to the fact that throughout the passage of so many ages since the time of R.C. Xerxes, no one has been so bold as to add or take anything away from the Jewish canon. This assertion can be empirically tested and measured in the following case. If the Jews were so inclined to add a work to their canon after the time of R.C. Xerxes, it would have certainly involved the history of the Maccabees, portraying their epic struggle against the Secludians that marked one of the most important military campaigns since the time of David. Despite the importance of this event, which is still commemorated during Hanukkah, this was never added to the Orthodox Jewish canon. However, it was included in the Septuagint, the Jewish liturgy, the scroll of fasting, and the Talmud, thereby demonstrating objective evidence of the unchanging legitimacy of the Jewish canon. This measure is also supported by the finding that the Orthodox Jews would have considered a blasphemy to alter the canon after the reign of R.C. Xerxes by virtue of a belief that the Holy Spirit was withdrawn after the last books of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, a belief witnessed through rabbinic literature inside and outside the Talmud, demonstrating widespread belief, not private opinion. Therefore, any new work since the time of R.C. Xerxes would also be precluded by this criterion. Ultimately, it is upon these objective standards we evaluate the question of canonicity. Yet, it is important to frame the decisions on the Old Testament canon reached at the councils of Rome, Hippo, and Carthage in its proper context, in order to explain the purpose of the assembly and the underlying data and assumptions that guided them in affirming those canonical lists. Firstly, the political atmosphere leading into 382 saw the disintegration of the Arian party in the East in 378, Emperor Theodosius's effort to unify and attain consensus of all Christendom at Constantinople in 381, and Jerome's translation projects to secure standardized text for the Western churches beginning in 382. The councils in the West, in part, served a similar purpose, particularly in resolving ecclesiastical disputes, creating standards for the church, given the number of controversies, and achieving peace. Secondly, the byproduct of these canonical lists in the West do not stem from the Hebrew line, but a divergent Greek stream representing many competing traditions that came over into the Latin that doesn't even reconcile with the Greek apostolic churches. More importantly are the questionable assumptions underlying its decisions on these texts. As we consider Augustine's statement in his titled work, The City of God, it is important we give it the proper context 
considering he represents this historical period's defining spirit, a spirit that valued the tradition of preserving the writings they had received in accordance with his ecclesiastical constitution. His goal in this section, I believe, is to strike a delicate balance between Jerome's translation project and the long-standing place of honor the Septuagint has held among the Greek congregations, as to not cause disruption among the congregations. To that end, here is the problems with that approach. Firstly, Augustine recognized the book of Maccabees as canonical on account of the extreme and wonderful sufferings of certain martyrs, despite his observation that the record is not witnessed by the Jews. For the apocryphal works of Wisdom and Ecclesiasticus, canonical status is granted due to some resemblance of style with Solomon's three recognized works, even though the more learned scholars did not support this conclusion. It seems in Augustine's pursuit of peace, he even constructs a postmodern narrative to frame both the Hebrew canon and the Septuagint on equal footing, despite its many differences, with the Spirit speaking at various times and places in each version. This is the reasoning one must resort to when they choose to ignore the biblical injunction that solely recognizes the Jews as the appointed witnesses and sidesteps an empirical foundation for a subjective one which only leads to diversity of opinion in answering this question as evinced in the Greek and Latin textual traditions. Notwithstanding, just as Irenaeus looked out across the known world and made an empirical observation of the textual tradition witnessed in every apostolic church, we too examine the canon echo throughout the Orthodox Jewish synagogues that have come down to us, which provides independent attestation to the same writings recognized in the Protestant confessions, meeting the criterion of Catholic and apostolic for the Jewish canon. The empirical observation carries great weight in advancing our thesis, since in any normal court of law, independent witnesses that agree with relevant knowledge of the facts, having not colluded on their testimony, would be conclusive. The Orthodox Jewish communities were never one unified group, and neither were the rabbis. Even the Talmud, which represents the collection of writings that cover the full gamut of Jewish law and tradition, has two separate versions. Yet the various groups that subscribe to either the Babylonian or Jerusalem text only recognize one canon, which is a testament to the consistency in their canonical tradition. Even the testimonial evidence available to us from relevant and notable historians further corroborate this form of the Jewish canon. Despite Augustine's opinion on the matter, he did confirm that the Jews of his day found Jerome's labors to be faithful representatives of their orthodox canonical tradition. We must also certainly give substantial evidential weight to the testimony of Josephus on account of two observations. First, he is unlikely to have gotten away with lying much about the Jewish canonical tradition, given he was in a perpetual public battle with the rival historian Justice of Tiberius, who composed similar historical treaties. Second, Josephus' description of the 22 books is consistent with the Orthodox Jewish canonical tradition, especially since the grandson of Sirach also witnesses to a threefold formula, corroborating the record in Josephus. Additionally, the details recorded in the Talmud, Bhava Bhaktra 14b through 15a, on the books and authors of the Hebrew canonical tradition provide further confirmation of our thesis, leading to only one natural conclusion. How else do we explain these facts other than this canonical tradition among the Orthodox Jews represents a receive an authoritative canon of the Old Testament? affirmed in the Anglican and Protestant confessions. While I assume that Mr. Horn may dispute some of this evidence, I'd like to emphasize that the statistical probability of the accumulated documentation being incorrect is almost zero. There was never one Jewish group that was able to control Judaism, even to this day. This explains why we saw two major kingdoms, yet no emperor, caliph, or pope, who could have had the power and authority to make such a binding canonical determination throughout the synagogues. 
In the Hellenistic period, there were writings that came into the Greek world that were respected by the Jewish communities, similar to the letters of Fatima, but they were not put into the canon. There is no conclusive evidence these works were ever part of the Jewish canon. And in the major studies throughout church history, the learned opinion of Jerome, Cardinal Jimenez, Cardinal Cajetan, and the Anglican Church held that they should not be admitted as canonical works or have authority over doctrines in the church, but simply read for the edification of the people. Uh, with that, I stop my time and uh, thank you, uh, Trent, uh, for listening to my thesis. Oh, you uh, finished up a little early. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, Trent, uh, your time begins when uh, you are ready. So, will you be sharing anything or no? Uh, no, I'm I'm too old school. I guess I don't have a <laughs> fancy slide like Jonathan. I'll right. try to make up with it with other flair, I suppose. So, okay. whenever you're ready. All righty. Well, I'd like to thank Canadian Catholic for hosting this debate and Jonathan for being willing to participate in it. I really enjoyed a lot of his other engagements. He's done great work uh, against Richard Carrier. So uh, he's an excellent scholar, though I do believe he's mistaken uh, in this regard. So let's talk a little bit about the resolution. We're, Jonathan wants us to believe that Christians should only accept the 39 books of the Old Testament that are found in the Protestant canon. And I would ask, well, what standard has he put forward that would bind all Christians, uh, Catholic, Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, to this particular standard? Uh, where does it come from, and does it have good evidence to support it? In order to show that no such standard exists, and that it's actually the standard he's advocating is contradicted by biblical and historical evidence, I want to take you on a little historical tour of the Old Testament canon. So let's start with the last books of the Protestant Old Testament. There's no evidence that the canon was closed at this time. Uh, the books themselves don't make any mention of this. Uh, in fact, as the Baptist scholar Lee Martin McDonald points out, the book of Malachi only implores its listeners to remember the law of Moses, which would be strange if there was a fixed set of writings established by Ezra called the prophets at this time. So even the last books of the Old Testament don't give any hint that of the Protestant Old Testament, I should say, that a canon had been closed at this time. Uh, what about the deuterocanonical works themselves? These works would include Sirach, Wisdom, Tobit, Judith, Baruch, First and Second Maccabees, and portions of Daniel and Esther. Do they give any indication that they were written during a period of a closed canon? No, not at all. Authors of texts like Sirach, for example, said they were led to write down God's wisdom, which indicates they thought they were writing scripture. Now, the Jews did settle on a threefold division of scripture, the law and the prophets and the writings, or the ketuvim, uh, but the writings was a category that was open. It wasn't anything that was closed. The Old Testament scholar Otto Kaiser says, the deuterocanonical books presuppose the validity of the law and the prophets and also utilize the ketuvim, or writings collection which was, at the time, still in the process of formation and not yet closed. MacDonald, as I said, a Baptist scholar, writes, All sacred books that were not a part of the law were considered by Jews, Jesus, and his followers to be a part of the prophets. And biblical scholar Andrew Steinman, who holds to an early closing of the Hebrew canon, even admits that when it comes to Second Maccabees' reference to the prophets, we can't be certain what the content of the prophets were. So we know that there were the law, the prophets, and the writings during this time period, but it was somewhat open as to what were contained in them, including the deuterocanonical books. Uh, Jeffrey Hanneman, another scholar, says in his book on the Jewish canon that the writings, the remaining element after the law and the prophets, still appear undefined to New Testament writers. Uh, and this can also be included in the Talmud itself, in Tract Baba Kama 92b, quotes Sirach 1215 as belonging to the division of the writings of the Old Testament. So there's not really any evidence that during the time prior to Jesus that there was a belief that the Old Testament canon was closed. Uh, but what about around the time of what of the Old Testament, sorry, around the time of the first century, Jews during this period? In Jonathan's opening statement, he made a lot about how Jewish orthodoxy defines 
the Old Testament canon. But this is extremely problematic because Jews of the first century had divergent opinions about the content of the Old Testament canon. For example, the Essene Jews, uh, whose writings have been preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they recognize deuterocanonical books as being inspired. The Qumran scholar Emmanuel Tove says that books like Sirach were writ that we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls were written in a special layout reserved for biblical compositions. Even when it comes to the Pharisees, whose canon was much closer to the Protestant Old Testament canon, it still wasn't exact. The scholar Timothy Lamb in his book, Formation of the Jewish Canon, writes this. Paul belonged to a Jewish sect that had a canon that was determined, but not yet defined. We do not know the extent of his canon. Paul's letters were occasional, and the scriptural texts that he cited and used were determined largely by the circumstances in which he was writing. So we see this even among rabbis of the first century. There are disputes about Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, Esther, and other similar books in the Old Testament canon. So we don't have even unification among the Jews uh, during this time period. But what we do have is use of the Septuagint, uh, which would be the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And it did include the deuterocanonical books. Timothy Michael Law, who serves as the co-editor of the Oxford Handbook on the Septuagint, says the deuterocanonical books were included in the Septuagint, and that, quote, it would be a mistake to imagine that they had never been read as divine scripture. Paul also, Paul himself drew extensively on themes from deuterocanonical works in his own writings. So when Jonathan says that Paul never privileged uh, the Septuagint, sure, he didn't do so explicitly, but we can tell that he certainly used the Septuagint in his own writings. Denver Seminary professor Joseph Dodson says that scholars for at least three centuries have found value in comparing the deuterocanonical book of wisdom and Romans. According to the Protestant scholar David A. De Silva, New Testament authors weave phrases and recreate lines of arguments from apocryphal books into their new texts. They also allude to events and stories contained in these texts. The word paraphrase very frequently provides adequate description of the relationship. We also see this in other New Testament works. Look at the letter to the Hebrews, which some people would attribute to Paul, which would bolster support my argument for Paul's view of the Septuagint. But even if you treat Hebrews as anonymous, it still shows the New Testament reliance on the Septuagint. For example, Hebrews 10.5, when quoting the Psalms, uses for a prophecy of Jesus a Septuagint rendering of the verse that relates to a body being prepared for me in relation to the incarnation. Uh, Hebrews 11.35 in that Hebrews chapter 11 has the long history of people in salvation history, Abraham, Moses, Gideon, David. But then it says that there were some people in salvation history who, quote, were tortured, refusing to accept release, that they may rise again to a better life. The only record of an event like this, it's not found in the Protestant Old Testament canon. It's found in the Deutero canon in 2 Maccabees chapter 7 which describes brothers who accept torture over violating Jewish law in hope for a better resurrection. The Catholic apologist Gary Machuda has posted excerpts on his website from 50 Protestant commentaries that agree that Hebrews 11 is drawing from 2 Maccabees 7 in this regard. And since the context of Hebrews 11 includes men of old who received divine approval, it follows that the books describing the Maccabean martyrs were part of the Old Testament. They weren't secular history. They were part of a sacred history the author of Hebrews was citing. Or to provide another example, many Protestant scholars say that Wisdom chapter 2 contains a messianic prophecy. That's because verse 18 describes the enemies of the righteous one, saying, if the righteous one is the son of God, God will help him and deliver him from the hand of his foes. Now, this perfectly parallels Matthew 27:43 which records the Jewish leaders taunting Jesus about God saving the Son of God during the crucifixion. No other passage in the Protestant Old Testament describes a promise that God will rescue the Son of God from his enemies, but wisdom too does. So Matthew, so this is either a prophecy, or as some scholars say, Matthew is using wisdom as a framework in writing his gospel. Uh, so I think that it's very clear here that we see the use of the Old Testament uh, so we're going before the time of Jesus. There is no evidence that there was a uniform Jewish canon that matched the Protestant canon Jonathan is referring to here. In fact, we had divergence. We had the Essenes who had more books, 
Pharisees who were disputed about some books like Song of Songs uh, or Esther. Uh, and also we had other Jewish groups that had a radically truncated version of the canon. Uh, there's good arguments that the Sadducees only accepted the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Old Testament since they denied doctrines like the resurrection of the dead. So we can't really speak of a Jewish canon that would be binding upon all believers today. Rather, during the time of Jesus, there were Jewish canons. Uh, then later, what, what happens, though, is that after the time of Jesus, well, what happens with the canon after the time of Jesus? The Jewish canons become consolidated in the early second century during the second Jewish revolt against Rome under Rabbi Akiva. And this becomes very clear that there was still a multiplicity of canons at this time, because in the Talmud, tract Sanhedrin 100b refers to rabbis withdrawing Sirach or declaring it to no longer be inspired and removing it from synagogue reading. Uh, so they withdrew Sirach and the other deuterocanonical books, which is evidence that during this time in the first and early second century, there were a large number of Jews, many of them probably Jewish Christians, who were reading these books as uh, inspired scripture. But what about Josephus? Jonathan mentioned him. Let's talk about after the time of Jesus, the Jewish canon. What does Josephus have to tell us? It's true that some Protestants cite Josephus in his mention of the 22 books of sacred history that terminate in the reign of Artaxerxes of Persia around the 5th century BC. Uh, but the problem here is that the claim, it's the claim that these 22 books only account for the 39 books of the Protestant Old Testament. Uh, the other issue that we, that we have to resolve here is the, the claim that Josephus is saying books written after Artaxerxes uh, are, are not inspired. He doesn't say that. Rather, what he says is that there is not an exact, prior to Artaxerxes, there is an exact succession of prophets. He then says the books after Artaxerxes in Judaism do not preserve the exact line of prophetic succession. How, so they are not in held as high esteem, but they still recognize that there is a time of prophets. Uh, Josephus mentions prophets existing after that time period, which would not preclude uh, prophetic books or inspired books being written. And of course, inspired books can be written by people who are not even prophets. Uh, and it's true, Josephus does mention this. We also have to take into account some of the things he says is that he's prone to exaggeration. What he's saying here about the, the he says things like, from their very birth, all Jews know and esteem the book's of scripture. No one has ventured to add or to remove or alter a syllable of the Hebrew scriptures, which contradicts modern scholarship that knows there were multiple Hebrew manuscript traditions at this time. Uh, Josephus is writing in against Appion a apologetic for the Jewish faith, and scholars recognize that he tends to exaggeration on this point. Uh, Joseph Campbell in, his, uh, Campbell, in his study of Josephus, says that Josephus's rhetoric has run ahead of reality. It undermines the theory that there was a single canon by the late first century. Now, what about the early church fathers? So for me, if I'm going to look to see what canon of scripture we should use, I would ask, what did those who inherited the faith of the apostles use? And when we look, we see an abundant amount of testimony among the church fathers that the deuterocanonical books of scripture are indeed inspired. You can find over 70 citations in the pre-Nicene fathers alone, people like First Clement, for example, going through, recognizing, and citing these books, not just citing them, but citing them as scripture, using them to confirm prophecy. After the Council of Nicaea, we also see this. Cyril of Jerusalem refers to Baruch as the prophet, and he uses Baruch in defense of the deity of Christ. Athanasius called the book of wisdom in Judith scripture, and he appealed to wisdom chapter seven as evidence for the deity of Christ. The Anglican scholar J.N.D. Kelly says that for the great majority of the early church fathers, the deuterocanonical writings ranked as scripture in the fullest sense. In fact, the only outlier to all of this, uh, the most prominent outlier, frankly, really the only one, is St. Jerome, who followed the mistaken view that there was only one Hebrew uh, manuscript tradition, the Masoretic text, that should be followed in translation, and that the Septuagint is just a poor copy of the Hebrew Masoretic text. Uh, but as scholars like Megan Hale Williams has shown, this was a, quote, idiosyncratic insight 
followed by Jerome, that the rest of the church did not follow and was later corrected a few decades later at the regional councils of Hippo and Carthage. In fact, Jerome doesn't follow the Protestant Old Testament canon. He accepts the writings of Deutero Daniel, for example. Uh, and he himself included these works in his translation of the Vulgate because of the immense pressure from the rest of the people, rest of Christendom as having accepted these books. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in my rebuttal. Uh, but when it comes to Jerome, he even says that uh, the Council of Nicaea accepted Judith as a part of the canon of Scripture. So with the one lone tradition of Jerome, using this idiosyncratic view of Hebrew manuscripts as later turned out to be correct, that is the one witness against all of these other witnesses within the ancient church holding to a larger canon. Uh, in fact, I would wonder if Jonathan would also agree with Jerome about other doctrines like the perpetual virginity of Mary. And if not, why does he accept Jerome on some things rather than others? Uh, well, so I think when you put all that together, we see there is no standard uh, that Jonathan has offered that should compel Christians to accept the shorter Protestant Old Testament canon and dissuade them from going with the longer canon that was popular, as J.D. Kelly says, with the great majority of the church fathers. All right, Trent, that is just on time. Uh, let me just take this away. All right, so Jonathan, you're muted. Uh, but now we will move into the rebuttal period. So Jonathan will get seven minutes. And do you still have slides or no for this one? No, no slides. I, I, I wanted to, as, as much as I, I've seen uh, lots of uh, Trent Horn's work. And uh, once again, very impressed with your work as well, Trent. I thought you did an excellent job against Matt Dillahante. Um, Gavin, I think you've done some really good stuff against uh, Gavin as well and some of the others. Uh, so great work all around. Uh, thank you, uh, Joshua, for having us on. Um, and, 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 with, and with that, let me. Uh, yep. uh, let me... All right. So uh, whenever you're ready. OK, yeah, let me uh, start now. So uh, let me address uh, some of the observations uh, that Trent made uh, during his opening. I think. Uh, the first thing I, I want to address is, yes, um, obviously, Paul, whose ministry was to the Greeks, is obviously going to be using uh, a, a translation that had been in the public, that had been used, uh, you know, for the Greeks, uh, for him to use. His ministry is primarily uh, focused on uh, the Gentile nations, and obviously, in quoting scripture, he would do that. Now, uh, as Trent noted, uh, he didn't privilege it. And what we see in uh, the apostles, what we see in, um, you know, Paul's writings is he uses a lot of quotations, uh, not only from the Septuagint, but he quotes pagan authors. Uh, we even see Jude uh, making reference to Enoch. And that is something I think uh, both uh, the Jews agree on. Uh, you know, the, the Catholics and the Protestants, with the exception of Ethiopia on that. So uh, they were quoting a number of different uh, items, pagan histories, works like Enoch, the Septuagint, but this doesn't sanction that version as the official. And this is where Paul does do that. Uh, uh, in the biblical injunction say that the Jews are the appointed witnesses. Uh, and one of my points of Jerome is in both his translation projects, he stressed the emphasis of going back to the single fountainhead, given the divergent manuscript traditions that were out there. Uh, for the New Testament, uh, he felt the need to go back to the original Greek. And for uh, the Old Testament, given that uh, the Latin is uh, three places removed from the Hebrew, he wanted to go back to the Hebrew and make an empirical observation of the canon that they had. So that establishes our framework uh, from the starting point. Now, I also want to bring up the fact of what Trent mentioned uh, at the beginning regarding the Essenes having some affinity uh, for the books of uh, Syriac. Now, uh, to explain that in its proper context, what we find in the D Dead Sea Scrolls, in addition to all the other literature, is, uh, I believe it's three uh, sole uh, manuscripts or parchments 
of Syriac. But uh, Trent there is laying a foundation that just because they're found within the collection, and once again, we do not know uh, specifically who those people were that were probably running off into the caves as a result of war. And they're bringing their labor libraries with them. Just like I have libraries over here, I'm going to take a number of works. While I have the Bible, I'm going to take some of the church fathers. I'm going to take Philo. But this doesn't mean I esteem all the works of the same literature. And uh, Trent may be a little hard-pressed to substantiate that foundation that whatever group did own those texts considered those texts canonical. And we understand these writings are used within the Jewish liturgy. Uh, Maccabees. Um, this is part of the Jewish histories. And I think one of the points that uh, Josephus makes is these are still recognized writings. These are writings within the Jewish tradition that have immense value, but they are not held at the same esteem as the earlier writings. And I think one of the things that we have to focus on is the empirical observation that the canon that did come down didn't uh, include these works that we can see from what Jerome saw. Uh, Augustine makes the same observation. Uh, another thing that, uh, you know, Trent mentioned was the uh, council, I, I believe he's referring to uh, Jamnia. Now, once again, in my opening, one of the things that I did stress was the fact that there was no universal bishop in Judaism. There's no council uh, that came to any definitive uh, definition in terms of this is going to be the authorized text and uh, we're going to send this out. Uh, what we do have in the latter end of the first century is discussions uh, that are occurring regarding some of these texts, the Song of Songs, and we can understand how a work of that nature would be purview, uh, purviewed by those outside uh, uh, Judaism with its strong uh, language. Uh, and they did discuss, you know, uh, certain works. But that's not the same thing as saying these works weren't already considered canonical. And Trent, I think to establish his position, we would need to see some sort of affirmation that went out or some letter. We don't even have the, the full information uh, from what was happening here at Jamnia to make any official determination. The only thing that we can see that was observed by Augustine, Jerome, even Origen, that there were items not received in the Jewish volume. And this is something that is consistent. But uh, one of my last points, since I know I'm running on time, is to understand the context which these documents were received. And while Trent does recognize that there was divergent manuscript traditions, Augustine does give us some background on why the Septuagint does help, why it held such a place of honor. So remember, uh, Jews and uh, Christianity and Judaism was separated for over 300 years. Uh, they weren't just openly handing the Hebrew text uh, to the Christian churches to use. What we had available was the Septuagint that had come into our possession and used for the first basically 300 years of Christianity. But uh, Augustine does let us know that uh, this is the only one that the churches really received. They weren't aware of the other editions uh, prior to that. And this is why it held such a place of honor among their congregations. Uh, I believe my time is up. Uh, so I Almost. Will... You were five minutes uh, all under, actually. So you, uh, you actually fit well into time. All right. Uh, I think, uh, Trent, whenever you're ready, please uh, just start. All righty. Well, thank you, Jonathan. And let me address some of the different points you've raised and try to tie us together so far. Uh, quickly, I, I didn't mention the Council of Jamnia. Uh, that's been known since Jack Lewis's article in 1964, What Do We Mean by Yavne, that there was no such Council of Jamnia in the first century. 
uh, that closed any canon. There was a Jewish rabbinical school uh, at Jamnia, but there was no such council. Rather, what I was arguing was that the closing of the Jewish canon and compiling all of these different canons that existed in the first century, uh, we don't see uniformity in the Jewish canon until after the time of Rabbi Ben Akiva uh, in the early second century during the Bar Kokhba revolt. Uh, and this is very clear reading through the Talmud and seeing, as I mentioned earlier, the withdrawing of Sirach from the synagogues. We don't see this uniformity until uh, the mid second century. And so for me, if um, yes, I agree that modern Judaism follows rabbinic Judaism in the early second century in denying the deuterocanonical works. But that carries absolutely no weight with me because rabbinic Judaism also denies the Gospels and the New Testament. Uh, so Jonathan cited Romans 3, 2, where Paul says that the Jews were given, uh, were entrusted with the oracles of God. That's in the aorist, in the past tense. Now, all Paul is saying here is that there is value in Judaism over being a Gentile because Jews were given divine revelation. And in fact, it doesn't necessarily mean scriptures. It says the oracles of God. N.T. Wright and A.T. Robertson say this just may talk about how the Jews were given general divine revelation itself. Nothing here says that the Jews had an enduring authority to determine what the canon is of the Old Testament. The people of God do, and the people of God is now found within the Christian church, with the Church of Christ. Uh, now, when it comes to the Septuagint, Jonathan says, yeah, yeah, Paul uses Septuagint, but he doesn't privilege it. I say he doesn't explicitly privilege it, he and the other uh, New Testament authors, but we can see it is heavily favored. Gleason Archer and Gregory Chai Richigno, uh, in their book, Old Testament Quotations in the New Testament, cite 33 places where the New Testament cites the Hebrew Masoretic text, but 340 places where it cites the Septuagint. So it's a 10 to 1 ratio in favor of the Septuagint. When it comes to the Essenes, I, I didn't make the argument that, well, the books are there in the caves, therefore they, re, they felt that they were scripture. I cited scholars like Emmanuel Tove that said there's a special stichographical layout uh, and parchment that is used. There's a special form of lettering and materials that are used to indicate these are biblical books that, that are used for the protocanonical books as well as for Sirach. Um, and when it comes to uh, why would it be the case uh, that even Jewish scholars have recognized why the canon was truncated in the mid-second century, the Jewish scholar Louis Ginsburg says that Akiva may have repudiated the use of the Greek Septuagint and the Deuterocanon. It was a desire to disarm Christians, especially Jewish Christians, who drew their proofs from the Apocrypha. It uh, must also be attributed his wish to emancipate the Jews from the dispersion, from the domination of the Septuagint, uh, and uh, the other things that Jewish Christians were using from the Septuagint and from the Deuterocanonical books in their particular uh, disputations with the Jews, such as what I referenced earlier, like applying the prophecy and wisdom chapter two to the description of Christ's crucifixion in Matthew 27. In one of Jonathan's slides, it talked about uh, the Jewish authorities saying that prophecy had been taken away, uh, indicating that Jews believed that prior to the time of Christ, the canon was closed. Although Jonathan hasn't provided any citations to show that this belief, dating this belief prior to rabbinic Judaism, uh, which I would say is uh, that the Talmud speaking about this is engaging in revisionist history. Uh, you know, he hasn't cited any citations from prior to Christ saying that the canon was closed. In fact, we have manuscripts uh, of things like the Septuagint, what are called the Kai Gay recension. Uh, that's a manuscript of the Septuagint produced by the Pharisees that has deuterocanonical books like Baruch in it. And in fact, when we even look at these Talmudic uh, writings talking about prophecy being taken away, it doesn't talk about a general closing of the canon or an ending of divine revelation prior to Christ. Baba Batra 12b says that uh, from the day on which the house of the sanctuary was destroyed, which is the old temple, Solomon's temple, prophecy was taken away from prophets and given over to sages. So it talks about a different manner of prophecy being delivered, not it simply being ended. Uh, Jonathan also talked about the criterion, like what do we use to determine if something's canonical, like all the Jews received these books. Uh, as I said, that's actually quite disputed is what I've shown. But also dispute itself, some not receiving them, this would apply to New Testament books. 
There were church fathers who didn't accept the book of Revelation, who had doubts about Hebrews, doubts about the letters of John. So if we try to apply doubts about the Deuterocanon, the apostolic period, uh, to account against its canonicity, that would apply to some New Testament works as well. Now, his citation of Augustine, I found to be very odd uh, that Augustine recognized that the Jews of his time by then had certainly rejected the deuterocanonical books of Scripture, but Augustine and Tertullian certainly did not, the two, a father and ecclesial writer that Jonathan mentioned. Uh, Augustine quotes the Book of Wisdom. He says it's, he calls it one with many passages of Holy Scripture. He calls its author a prophet, uh, and he uses the Book of Wisdom that because it contains a prophecy about what will happen uh, at the Judgment Day. According to the Catholic scholar Charles Costello, uh, St. Augustine not only states that these early fathers regarded the Book of Wisdom as one of the divine scriptures, but also testifies and gives proof they use its authority in support of Catholic teaching. So Augustine accepted the, De the Deuterocanon not because of one line about the Maccabean martyrs. That's just one isolated line from his writings. He over and over talks about it because it's the accepted opinion of the church that he's receiving. And he goes back to authors like St. Cyprian to recognize that. Um, well, I had, a, I had a comment here on the Anglican use of the Deuterocanon. I'll save that for later. That would be fun. I'm almost out of time. So, um, right. so let's uh, end it there. And then I'm interested to hear more of Jonathan's responses. Yeah, that's fine. And that was, again, just in time. Okay, now we move on to four-minute rebuttals, uh, rebuttal period. Um, and again, I think we will continue with the alternating order. So, Jonathan, uh, whenever you're ready, uh, please, uh, let's go. Four minutes. Okay. I'll start now. Uh, thank you, uh, Trent. Uh, let me go into a couple of points uh, that you had brought up. Um, now, and to kind of uh, clarify my position is uh, from the Talmud. And once again, the Talmud is based on their ancient archives. So while uh, the production of these records uh, do come into being uh, later, starting in the third century and working its way down the next few hundred years, they are based on much more older ancient traditions uh, that uh, Josephus even refers that he had access to uh, in his antiquities. Now, regarding the uh, departing or the withdrawing of the spirit, and what we mean by that is uh, what they say. Uh, while the book of Exeter was composed in the spirit of prophecy, uh, the spirit was withdrawn after this. Now, what that doesn't preclude, because while I'm well aware that in these writings it does refer to uh, the spirit, uh, the Talmud also gives us a little bit more information on that, that while the spirit was withdrawn, uh, they would still nevertheless still make use of the divine voice. And this is what we see in some of the literature from Josephus um, and other ancient uh, uh, writers uh, doing the work. I mean, to this day, you know, we, we <laughs> as Christians still say the you know, we still utilize the voice. But not everything uh, that the, we say is going to be thrown into the canon. Uh, the other thing I want to bring out uh, from Trent's statement is this idea that uh, Kiva may have in some manner helped uh, formulate the standardization or created this movement to help uh, standardize the canon. Because that. I think where I do see there's some agreement uh, between Trent and I is when Augustine Jerome is looking out of the Jewish rabbinic tradition, this is the tradition that they see. So it must have been part of some sort of movement to standardize. Uh, the only problem with that is obviously if it was done after the Barcova war, before it, not only was there their war, uh, but the Jews were dispersed. Uh, they were still in Babylon, uh, they were in Yemen, uh, they were in Egypt. And, you know, one of the interesting points made by Rabbi uh, Solomon of uh, Barcelona during the Middle Ages, who also had to deal with these uh, polemic attacks on their canon, undergoing these amendments or standardizations or changes, is if something did happen, uh, given that there was no central authority, 
we would see evidence of it in the manuscript uh, traditions from the standpoint of the later groups. Uh, Trent did recognize that, well, there were groups. We, we definitely understand that the Samaritans were only using uh, their version of the Torah. Uh, I'd probably disagree a little bit with uh, Trent on the Sadducees. Uh, but, uh, what we do see is we had groups that only kept, uh, this form of the scripture, but after the second century, what we don't have is any definitive, uh, document. Uh, we don't have actual testimonial evidence from the period to show how they would have orchestrated such an action throughout all of the known world throughout the Roman empire. Uh, there's no letters to this effect. You would have to have reached uh, synagogues and Jewish communities all throughout the known world. And there is no indication of that. And Rabbi, uh, not, oh, yeah, your time is up, but that's fine. I think, I mean, if you just want to finish your point, that's totally fine. Yeah, my, my, my final point is if something of this magnitude happened, there would have been some groups that would have maintained their loyalty to the textual tradition that they believed was correct. And we'd be able to empirically see this uh, tradition in Judaism after the mid-second century. Some group would have held up this. And with that, I'll stop my time. All right, no worries. Okay, uh, Trent, we will go with another uh, four minutes. Uh, I think whenever you're ready, we'll start. Sure. <clears throat> in response to what Jonathan has said, uh, well, I, I can think of one group that has held this. The Ethiopic Jews to this day uh, have a wider canon, uh, some of which includes what we call the deuterocanonical books. Uh, so there were Jews, even after the advent of rabbinic Judaism, that did not sign on to this radically truncated canon that was present in the Septuagint that was used during the time of Jesus and the Apostles. Um, well, let me try to pull everything together here before we kind of have a, a back and forth. Uh, what I've tried to find here is, is Jonathan given us a, a standard to say, all right, uh, the Old Testament is only comprised of these 39 books. Well, how would we know that? As I've shown, uh, the Old Testament itself doesn't, the Protestant Old Testament itself does not say that. Uh, the uh, deuterocanonical books don't act as if the canon itself was closed. During this time, they they don't act like that they're going against the grain in this regard or that any of that had ceased uh, by the time of the first century, the time of Jesus and the apostles. There are multiple canons that are in existence. Jonathan disputed about the Sadducees, but he didn't offer any reason to think that they had a, a radically truncated canon or showing that we knew that the Pharisees had the same canon Protestants do. Uh, it was a uh, it was not a fully determined canon at that time, as I showed from the scholars that I cited, like Lamb and Formation of the Jewish Canon. So, so far through all of this, the only the first source that we really get that gives us uh, a Protestant canon would be the writing of Josephus. But I've already shown that Josephus, as Campbell cites, his rhetoric runs ahead of reality. He's known for exaggeration. And then when we compare that to how the Deuterocanon was used among the Apostolic Fathers, who quoted it as scripture, uh, that it's true that you have uh, different quotations, whether it's the Dead Sea Scrolls or others, the, the New Testament quotes, uh, Greek poets, uh, you know, you have Enoch being quoted by some church fathers. But what you don't have with these books that you do have with the Deuterocanon is you have a trajectory of calling this divine scripture, of using it to cite prophecy, of using it to prove uh, Christian doctrine. Uh, using metonyms and other introductions like it is written. Uh, so the only time and then in the second century, as I showed my citations from the Talmud, we see Jewish rabbis saying that the books of Sirach and others are being withdrawn. Now, Jonathan's right. It would take some time. And so we see. But that's exactly what happened. We see it took time for. Uh, Jews to be able to determine what were and were not the sacred books. In fact, this can be seen in Melito of Sardis in the second century, who sought out to write up a list of the Jewish canon, but instead of going to the local synagogue in Sardis and just asking, what's your canon? He goes all the way back to Jerusalem, to the Holy Land, to find out because 
even by this time, there was not uniformity, and this belief in rabbinic Judaism had to spread. Uh, so we see this standard arises, but it's not a standard that comes from any kind of divine revelation. Uh, it is a standard that ultimately comes from the opinions of some rabbis who sought to restructure Judaism in the light of the destruction of the Second Temple. And in that respect, we're not bound to follow that decision that they made. Rather, we should follow the tradition that has been given to us uh, from the churches in time immemorial. So um, that is what I will put out there. Well, how much time do I have, Josh? You're 20 seconds uh, or so. Let's see. That means if I keep talking, I only have 10 seconds left. I'll leave it at that, and then we'll I'm sure we'll have some discussion back and forth. All right. All right. Great. Uh, okay. So now we will start the cross-examination period, and this will be 15 minutes. And again, I will just go into alternating order because I, I know some people do it otherwise, but I think this is easier for me. So, Jonathan, you will have 15 minutes to cross-examine cross Trent, and then we'll just repeat that uh, back with Trent doing it. So we'll start the time whenever you're ready. Okay, I, I guess for my first question, um, and, and Trent, uh, obviously you're very familiar with the history leading up into uh, the Council of Rome's decision. Uh, we know Christianity was in hiding or underground uh, until the Edict of Milan. Uh, we we're being persecuted uh, by the Romans. There, there was this division or separation uh, from Judaism. Uh, we inherited a tradition through the Greeks, not the Romans, that we throughout were predeposed to. This was the one that uh, we placed a lot of value on. So given that environment um, and before the start of Jerome's translation project, which took a while, was the Church of Rome... And, and even uh, Hippo and Carthage to that degree, in the best position to address this question, given uh, the prior influences over the last three, 400 years. Okay, so I'm not sure I understand. Okay, so the question is uh, that there is Roman persecution uh prior to the times of the councils of hippo carthage uh and pope damas's declaration of rome on the so, canon is it is it are they, are they in a good position to accurately reflect what the canon of the old testament was because well, of yeah, and, yeah in, in the sense that um the, there hasn't been any real serious study of this question and uh they've been predisposed to a uh tradition of the septuagint uh, in their churches for the last 300 years. So how much influence do you think that had in framing out their uh, canonical list in 382? Right. Well, first, I would uh, dispute the assumption in the question that there was this constant persecution that would have prevented the church from having an accurate assessment of how the Word of God is handed down. First, by the time we have these councils at the end of the 4th century, Christianity had already been had legal toleration for 60 or 70 years. By the time of the councils, Christianity was now the official religion of the Roman Empire under Theodosius. Uh, but even before this point, there were persecutions, but um, they weren't constant. They still allowed for uh, engagements between Christians and Jews. And so we see this uh, in Origen and Melito when they write up what is handed on to the Jews and they create these canonical lists, but they explicitly contrast these lists with the divine scriptures that Christians venerate. So I would say the councils are in a good uh, position to know what has been uh, uniformly celebrated in the liturgy, in the churches, what is read in the churches. Um, you know, For example, Origen cites uh, the deuterocanonical books he also cites Enoch, but he says Enoch is not read in the churches. Now, that wasn't entirely true. There were some who did. But we see that they can recognize a general trajectory of accepting these books. And I don't see anything, any external factors that would prevent the councils in North Africa or Pope Damasus from recognizing what had been generally received. So I don't quite see the problem here. Uh, for my next question, I, I think one of the things that we do realize is that Maccabees is 
well as it's highly revered in uh, the Jewish tradition. I mean, it's celebrated every year. It's part of the uh, Jewish liturgy. It's uh, part of the scroll of fasting. Uh, given the significance of this event, why don't we see this work uh, in the Jewish canon, given its value, uh, something that they would not necessarily uh, be against? Doesn't this go against your notion that this was at any time considered canonical by the Jews? And how do we explain that uh, the high priestly class, like a Judas Maccabeus or mm -hmm. his family line, who would have had power to add it, there's no record that they did. So your question is, if Maccabees is inspired, uh, why didn't the Jews recognize it? Though I think that question, it, it is assuming partially what it's trying to prove, because uh, I would say, how do we know that it was not recognized as scripture uh, prior to the second century in the Talmud and rabbinic Judaism? I would say the burden of proof would be on one to say that Maccabees was not accepted as scripture during this time period. Certainly later in later rabbinic Judaism, for whatever reason they had for not accepting books written after the time of Sirach, it wasn't accepted. But I see no reason to believe that it was not accepted prior to that time. Uh, we see Jesus celebrating the, uh, the Festival of Lights. You know, that's referenced in the New Testament. Uh, but also, I guess another point that I might bring up is that even if something was a Jewish festival, uh, writings related to it, there could still be controversy related there and why it might not be adopted. Uh, Purim is a widely accepted Jewish festival, uh, but that didn't prevent uh, some... Uh, scholars, or sorry, some Jewish and rabbinic traditions from not accepting the book of Esther. Uh, Esther was extremely controversial uh, because the proto-canonical sections of Esther, the shorter version in the Jewish and Protestant canons, doesn't even mention God. And so, it, you know, there was a, there's a lot of controversy there in relation to that uh, with Esther, as opposed to the longer Deutero sections, even though the story was been well known. Purim was celebrated. Uh, there was still significant controversy there. So I guess my answer to the question would be, I just reject the assumption built into it. There's rejection in rabbinic Judaism, but I don't see evidence that the book was rejected uh, prior to that point. And as I showed in my opening statement, there is evidence that Jewish Christians accepted it because of the citation I referenced in Hebrews chapter 11 to second Maccabees seven. Um, my, my next question uh, goes to a statement, and correct me if I'm wrong, Trent, uh, I think in a previous discussion uh, you've had on this, you discussed about uh, the differences in the Greek Orthodox um, canon. Obviously, they, they sort of have 10 or more. I think you mentioned if uh, they did come back in communion with Rome, we may possibly accept that canon. Um, and definitely let me know if I'm off pace. Well, so upon what standard or objective standard are you applying there where obviously you're not accepting them now? Does that also mean if the Church of Ethiopia comes under the communion of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, we would simply accept Enoch? So what empirical standard are you applying there um, if the Greek Orthodox Church came uh, back under communion with Rome? Mm -hmm. Well, first, I would say that this I'm willing to entertain this line of questioning, even though it's not germane to the question that we're debating here, which is that all Christians should accept the Protestant Old Testament canon. Uh, that's really the standard that we need to be debating. Uh, I do have a different standard, uh, and I'm happy to uh, defend that in a positive affirmation in, in another format, uh, which I believe that revelation is given to us both in scripture, sacred tradition, and the magisterium, that the apostles have successors. And I actually watched your inter your debate with Gavin Ortland on apostolic succession, nicely done, uh, that we, we share a belief in uh, some kind of authority continuing from the apostles. Uh, and so I would say that that, uh, that teaching authority is given to Christ church and it is what, uh, brings an, a definitive end to disputes that might arise about the nature of the canon. 
And so what we have at the Council of Trent in the in the 16th century is a, a solemn declaration about the canon in light of Protestants who rejected some deuterocanonical books, the deuterocanonical books, but other but, but and in referencing what are the contents of the canon, uh, Trent passes over in silence uh, other books. Uh, so what you're asking is really a kind of a, a hypothetical question there. Uh, the church teaches that the 73 or 72 books, depending on how you count them, books of scripture, that they are inspired, that's definitive, but it is not made a definitive judgment about other books. If the Eastern Orthodox came back into communion with Rome, what would we do there? And once again, this isn't really directly related to our debate, but I'll, I'll answer speculatively. I imagine if that were to happen, those books would have a kind of canonical, quasi-canonical status in that one would be permitted to recognize that they're scripture without being obliged to, since, since nothing in them contradicts the faith. And then maybe many, many, many years down the line, or centuries even, they would be fully subsumed and there'd be some recognition that the word of God was preserved in this Eastern tradition for thousands of years and wasn't fully recognized by the West. Just like when you look in the early years of the church, you'll see some apostolic traditions are more heavily preserved in certain geographic areas than others. But as I said, that would be a bit speculation. That's just the Catholic question on Catholic and Eastern Orthodox authority is interesting, but I do think it's important for us to stay focused on whether there is enough evidence that all Christians should accept the Protestant authority on the Old Testament canon. And, and I have not been convinced of such evidence. Uh, and, and to kind of turn back to that question, uh, get us back in core, um, uh, just relating to Augustine's criteria. Now, it's interesting because he does, in Contra Faustus, he lays out a big empirical framework on authorship, uh, on Christian doctrine. He lays out, while he does have a difference of opinion on this book, he does go back to an empirical framework. Now, when he talks about all the Catholic churches, obviously, I understand that in a broad sense uh, for the communities. And that those uh, who would be in greater authority. So given that the Jews were the guardians, uh, the re receptors of this check, would they have more authority over this question given their communities? Uh, unless we can specifically establish collusion among them over uh, the Christian churches. I mean, would that then reflect the Catholic part that it, it has been universally received as canon and they would be the ones of greater authority since these records trace back. And if these other documents are not there, it would naturally presume they were never received as their canon. So would we assign greater weight and authority on this question to the Jewish congregations over and above uh, the councils in the Western church? No, I would not do that uh, because, and this goes back to the crux of the disagreement that we're having. Uh, part of this is rooted in our understanding of what Paul means in Romans 3 2 when he says the oracles of God were entrusted to the Jews. Uh, once again, as I said, he's using the aorist or past tense uh, to describe how not necessarily. Uh, determination of canonical status is giving to the Jews, but rather what Paul is saying here in Romans three is that the oracles of God, which is an odd phrase to use rather than just the scriptures or the word of God, uh, as N.T. Wright says, this probably just refers to divine revelation itself. All Paul is saying here is that there are, you know, in Romans, Romans one, he gives the pagans a tongue lashing Romans two, he gives the Jews a tongue lashing. Then Romans 3, he says, but, you know, there's benefits to being uh, Jewish over being pagan. One is Jews received divine revelation. They were give God spoke directly to them. They were entrusted with it. But it does not follow from, from this that anyone who identifies as a Jew or just even a majority of Jewish thought has an exclusive ability to define what constitutes something like the Jewish canon or the Old Testament canon. Uh, and so for me, your argument would have significant weight if we could show that at the time of Christ, all the Jews accepted the canon you're defending in our debate today. 
uh, and uh, there was no evidence that Jesus and the apostles differed from them in any way, shape, or form. That uh, apos that time of apostolic Second Temple Judaism that is more interesting to me than later rabbinic Judaism that rejects the New Testament, rejects the Gospels. But as I showed, there is abundant evidence that Jews at the time of Christ accepted the deuterocanonical books uh, through the citations that I gave, and that they accepted them so much, later rabbis in the rabbinic period had to have those books withdrawn and had to lead people away from them. Uh, so if the authority was from Jews from the time of Christ, and Christ and the apostles agree with them, sure, yeah, but there's the evidence counts against that. If it's from the rabbinic period, that doesn't carry weight with me. You're muted, Jonathan. Sorry. Uh, uh, how much time do I have left? You have 25 seconds, but I'm fine with like one question. If that, like you go ahead, as long as Trent doesn't object. Trent, your thoughts? Uh, yeah. Last question uh, on this round. Um, now, Josephus, I, I know you've uh, made the assumption that he's exaggerating uh, in this point. Uh, obviously, he is a witness with uh, uh, knowledge of the, the Jewish histories. He had access. He was a court historian. But how likely, as I uh, opened up, given his public uh, rival, Justice Tiberius, who was writing a similar set of histories, uh, Josephus was um, uh, obviously, uh, you know, writing his own, considered a traitor. How likely is it he would have lied about these things, uh, given... Uh, Justice Tiberius writing something, and he would have been called out uh, in exaggerating this tradition, something that he would be familiar with. Is this where we would see exaggeration from Josephus? Well, as I cited in my reply, scholars admit that Josephus uh, lends himself to exaggeration. Uh, you know, he uh, devises speeches from battles where there are no surviving witnesses, for example, to deliver uh, speeches to him. Uh, now, I agree with you that Josephus is, uh, at least according to first century standards, a generally reliable historian telling us a lot about the first century, but he's far from infallible. And some things he talks about have to be taken with a grain of salt. So th the point I was talking about when it came to exaggerate, I mean, I agree. I don't think he lied. But exaggeration is not lying. That's getting carried away with your own rhetoric. That's what I meant when I cited scholars like Campbell and others who've done studies on Josephus saying his rhetoric is run ahead of reality. Like in Against Appion, when he's there, the apologetic he's doing and trying to say there are 22 books of the Jewish canon, the sacred histories up to Artaxerxes, that he would not be concerned about justice of Tiberius going up against him because both of them are trying to defend the authenticity and antiquity of Judaism. Uh, if we had the writings of Appian and other pagan or Egyptian critics, maybe we would get the other side on this point. That rather his writing it against Appian, uh, he makes these grand claims like every Jew from his birth knows the scriptures, knows what the scriptures are. No one has dared to change even a syllable in the manuscript traditions, which is which is patently false. Uh, and so here he is trying to defend against his pagan interlocutors. Uh, he's trying to say, look, you believe your views are ancient and well attested. Our ancient views are also well attested. Uh, he's not as concerned about after Artaxerxes because he's trying to defend the more and the more antiquated parts of Jewish history. And so he is defending that and throws some of the other parts on the bus, so to speak. But that still doesn't count against when he describes how there were prophets active after Artaxerxes. He never makes any kind of definitive statement of the canon being closed or, or anything like that. So I think ultimately Josephus's witness, uh, it may count for something, but I don't believe it has enough value to outweigh what we have from other Jewish witnesses, as well as from the church fathers who did receive the Deuterocanon as J and D Kelly, an Anglican historian says they received it as scripture in generally in the fullest sense. 
All right. Uh, thank you so much. Now, Trent, your rebuttal begins, and we will again go for 15 minutes. And guys, thank you so much for the questions. Just a reminder, after this rebuttal, we go to the Q&A uh, period. Uh, if you want to specify to whom the question is, uh, that's up to you. But if it's for both, that's totally fine, too. Uh, no problem or pressure there. Okay, Trent, whenever you're uh, ready, uh, we'll start. Okay, sure. Um, so, well, my first question would be, uh for Jonathan are what would who would you say is the first Christian author or church council to affirm the Protestant canon you are defending which would not include the Deutero canon or the longer portions of Daniel and Esther who would you say is the first church father or council or Christian writer that affirms that exact canon well, I, I think this would be consistent with Jerome's position. Um, and I think, uh, and, and once again, I, I do uh, frame that in the understanding that Jerome was under a lot of pressure. Uh, in, in some ways, uh, 382 after, you know, the Arians were just being uh, just done away with, they had come out. The last thing the, the Western church needed was another dispute of this magnitude. Uh, we, we know his uh, his book on uh, his translation of Job uh, incited a riot because of what they had remembered seeing uh, or hearing in uh, the Septuagint that has such a long established history. So uh, what we see consistent with Jerome, who does the first serious study on this from Jerome, is this position. And I think it is consistent in his writings that he did imply an empirical standard that we see in his uh, preface to the gospels that we need to go back to the hebrew line on the old testament and the greek line on the new so we understood that and he did understand that whatever wasn't received in the hebrew list and he does make this consistent affirmation should be set aside and only uh, partitioned to be read given his observation. So I, I would say uh, that Jerome is the first to really undertake this study. I don't think what uh, Origen did, even though his list and Melitos of Sardis is much more consistent uh, with uh, the, the Protestant confession, even though he had differences on uh, Daniel and some of the other uh, longer passages. But I would say his is. And and I think in, in some... So, so you would admit, though, that he doesn't agree with the Protestant uh, canon because he accepts that Deutero-Daniel is scripture based on the Theodosian Septuagint. Because So he, uh, so he does well, affirm... Would I, you agree with that, that he affirms Deutero-Daniel based on his letter to Rufinus? No, I, and I, I believe how I interpret that is uh, he's, he's stating uh, an opinion, and, and I think it goes back to his logic. Now he does say, I'm not uh, basing this on my opinion, but that of the Jews, which is consistent with his framework on this is how I'm going to formulate uh, the canon. And I think uh, in, in regards to Theodosian's version in his uh, commentary on Daniel, which he obviously uh, does a lot of work uh, trying to refute um, uh, uh, Porphyry of Tyre on that. He, he basically almost condemns uh, Theodosian's version and that uh, Porphyry was actually led astray by that version. So um, Jerome's uh, writings don't indicate how favorable he was. In Rufinius, what he's saying there is, this is not of my opinion, but he's bringing it back to the Jews, which is consistent what we see in his commentaries. So Ooh. I... I Sure. How do you square that with uh, his reply to Rufinus where he says this, the churches, not, so he's not talking about Jews, he says, the churches choose to read Daniel in the version of Theodosian, which is the longer Deutero Daniel. What sin have I committed in following the judgment of the churches? So there, doesn't that seem like that he's referring to a Christian tradition to defend a Deutero canonical writing versus looking at the Jews? Well, we got to remember the political reality of this environment that he's in. He's obviously 
um, not only his translation of Joe, but what he was, I, I mean, this caused a lot of commotion uh, throughout North Africa. Uh, he was receiving a lot of pressure, not only on this issue, but uh, uh, his, his work on the New Testament in the sense that he's being accused of being a forger, he's changing things, he's adding things. Um, but when I see that opinion, yes, and Augustine talks about that too. It, it's accepted on the church. Um, you know, the, the church has decided to receive it as authority. But uh, if we read the rest of uh, his response to Raphinius there, what he's saying is the Jews, uh, which I quoted, do not receive those records in their volume, which seems more consistent with the pattern that we see in Jerome's writing of him going back to that standard. I, I think he is trying to navigate a very difficult situation being attacked. Uh, and I give him a lot of credit. He's being attacked from all areas. Um, and Rufinius made these claims. He, he was being attacked. And this is how he's trying to navigate those waters. So I, I don't think he's giving, because uh, the Anglican Confession, we quote Jerome. That's our standard. Say, so, well, we separate them out. And I think that would be consistent with that passage uh, from Rufinius. Mm -hmm. I'll save my question of the Anglican Confession if we have time here. I'll, I'll stick to Jerome a little bit. Uh, so to see me, let me understand, make sure your argument are you saying that the witness of Jerome on the Deuterocanon, it should have a privileged place, at least, in our understanding of the Old Testament canon, because Jerome is a very able biblical scholar, he understands Hebrew, like, this is our, this is a, a really solid uh, ancient Bible scholar for us to follow, and uh, looking at the Hebrew in the Old Testament. What was that? Uh, Sorry, I thought I heard uh, something yeah, Jonathan, you're muted again. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, what I would yeah. say is, um, first, uh, we're, we're basing off what Jerome observed. And I think one of the points I did make in my opening was Augustine uh, in the City of God made that same observation that uh, Jerome was very learned. Uh, he was skilled in all three languages. And the Jews themselves also... Okay confirmed his work but let, let, let me let, i want to jump in though then the follow-up to that do you would you accept jerome's translation of genesis 315 uh where he translates it uh where god says i will put enmity between you and the woman th thy seed and her seed she shall crush thy head uh that famous passage in genesis 315 where it's normally translated as uh, he will crush the serpent's head. Uh, Jerome translates it as she shall crush the serpent's head. And from that, there have been a lot of Catholics who have derived a kind of uh, Marian typology from this in Genesis 3.15. Uh, given that Jerome is able scholarship, do you agree with his translation of it? Well, so here's what I, I would say about Oh, sorry. I, I got to move my mouth because it keeps going over that point. Uh, so what? here's what I would say about Jerome's translations. There's a number of things that I would uh, agree with his translations on. Um, and there's things that I may not. Now, in, in particular, uh, he, he was very familiar with the, with, with the Hebrew canon. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, he, he definitely exhibits that when he's writing back to Augustine on why he chose what he did, um, you know, in Jonah. So now, as far as accepting that, there are many things I do accept uh, from Jerome in his uh, textual critical analysis. Uh, and, and there's things that I don't, but it's still based on the weight of the evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and Jerome is making an empirical observation that seems consistent with what we find in Josephus, mm -hmm. what we find in the Talmud, what we find even in, uh, you know, the prologue to Syriac. So when we have independent witnesses coming to this same conclusion, uh, that's where we're weighing it in favor for mm -hmm. 
Uh, I, well, you, you cited one thing there, because those other examples would be after the time of Christ, and including after the writing of the majority of the, the New Testament, except for the prologue to Sirach. Uh, how, how would the prologue to Sirach show that there is any kind of closing of, a, of an Old Testament canon, uh, given that the author of Sirach, only, the author of the prologue, the grandson of Sirach, only notes the law, the prophets, and the other writings. So it's so. Would you agree that the author of the prologue of Syriac does not make an explicit statement the canon had been closed at that time? You're muted. Oh yeah. Um, so I. It's it's, it's it, it it is sort of consistent with what we're seeing, but I, I think the other thing that uh, you, you know. It, he, he talks about a threefold uh, division. And I think this is where I'm, I'm trying to establish resemblance to what we find in Josephus. So is it easier to pair that up with what Josephus is saying? And and he does give the writings period, you know, sort of an idea about our ancestors, you know, the books of our ancestors, the books that followed afterwards. And, you know, we have Josephus that gives some really good descriptions on what those writings are. And then we see in the Tracte, um, you, you know, in the Talmud, these things. So those are all consistent. And then Jerome comes in and sees these things. And that's where I would say it's not on any one piece of evidence. We have to look at where the independent witnesses are consistent and agree on these points. Trent, that's sure. That's why I think we well, got to. Would you agree then prior to Jerome? the vast majority of the church fathers and ecclesial writers cite the Deutero canon as scripture. Well, yes, I, I, I would agree. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, and I think that is based on a uh, predisposition to a text that uh, they weren't particularly connected with the Hebrew. Remember the uh, the Christians very early on in John, we see them uh, starting to get kicked out of the synagogues. Uh, obviously, there weren't uh, a lot of open sessions and dialogue uh, going through this period, and they're predisposed to a particular translation. And, and remember, there were other Greek manuscript traditions, and one of the things I've showed is just in the Greek tradition alone, you cannot conclusively come to what those de deuterocrino books are uh, unless you remain within one tradition. So the Septuagint provided at least somewhat of a consistency standard for the church and being deposed to that version of scripture, which Augustine says was widespread. They didn't know about any other version because they didn't have the affinity uh, to go to the Hebrew until uh, Jerome. And, and most did agree with it as divine scripture, though I would say what we find in the list that Eusebius provide from uh, Eusebius uh, from Origen, Amelis, uh, Melito of uh, Sardis, and what we see in the Brienne's list is much more consistent with the uh, with the Protestant canon than it is with the Catholic. Uh, uh, how much time do we have, Josh? Uh, you have two minutes. Okay. Uh, let me move forward in time then, because it seems like I also am concerned that this notion of a Protestant canon... Uh, might not be as unified as we think as if there, there was one that was just immediately recognized in 1517 or anything like that. So looking at the, the 39 articles of the Anglican church, um, the, the sixth article prohibits the use of the Deutero canon uh, to defend doctrine uh, or to confirm doctrine. Uh, but are you aware that the 35th article in the 39 articles, it recommends the book of homilies, uh, being used among Anglicans, which dates from the time of Edward VI, and that that book does use the Deutero canon uh, to support doctrine. I've always noticed that kind of a contradiction there in the 39 articles. I was just wondering if you were aware of that. Well, and, and, and let's put the uh, context of the homelies uh, in, in context of the period. First, um, not the saying that the Anglicans ever give bad uh, sermons, uh, but, you know, they did. And uh, the uh, the Homelies, a large set that was written by Thomas Cramer, uh, was used to uh, really build up 
um, you know, our core doctrines. But I find them still consistent because what do what do we say in Article Six? Is that uh, it should be read for the edification of the people. So they do have value uh, in this particular tradition um, because the sermons are to be read to the uh, churches. And I think uh, one of the things that I do want to uh, make sure you understand is the tradition that they should be read. Um, while I understand why some of the Protestant communions took a different direction, I think in large part, given the controversy of them being forced on uh, to accept mm -hmm. these works, that's why they split apart. But the homilies are consistent because we do read, we do accept that tradition that they should be read. Here's my, here's my last question then before we run out of time. Uh, here's the quotation from the 16th century Anglican Archbishop of Canterbury, John Whitgift. Uh, so I think there's to demonstrate a plurality of opinion here, a diversity. He says the scripture here called Apocrypha abusively and improperly are holy writings void of error, part of the Bible. And so accounted of in the purest time of the church and by the best writers ever read in the church of Christ and shall never be forbidden by me or by my consent. That would be so an Anglican archbishop in the late 16th century. Uh, I'm guessing you would probably just you your position would be in disagreement with with gifts. Then would be my question. Uh, no, because Wycliffe is saying they still should be read. But are you saying as well? He called he calls them holy writings, part of the Bible, void of error, accounted in the purest time of the church. It seems more ever read in the Church of Christ. It seems like he's saying more than just that they're a valuable set of writings, but that they're on par with Scripture. Seems to be in the opinion that he has. Um, I not that saying you're you're stretching on that a point, Trent. But how is that different? I mean, I would find that uh, consistent with uh, Cardinal Kajahan, uh, who obviously was greatly indebted to Jerome, uh, you know, on his separation of the canonical from uncanonical. Uh, but you know, he still considered them, um part of canon, not in the sense of establishing point of faith, but they're called canonical for the edification of the faithful, insomuch that they're received in the canon of the Bible for this purpose and treated with respect. Are, are you aware that Cardinal Cajetan uh, ha had a really, really, really high view of Jerome, that he actually said this, for the words of the councils, as well as of the doctors, are to be submitted to the correction of Jerome. That do you think it's possible that Cajetan and some other medieval scholars uh, might have uncritically followed Jerome uh, without taking all of the church's opinion on this matter into account? I would I would say here's why I would say no. Um, uh, Cardinal Jimenez, who was also who who was actually much more influenced uh, not only by Erasmus but by Lorenzo Valla on the work that he did on his textual studies, which led to his edition of the Complication uh, Bible. Um, and he, too, it went with the op uh, learned opinion of Jerome on this matter. So we have two high officials within the uh, Roman Catholic community, members of high standard, those that were actually involved in, uh, I mean, with uh, Cardinal Jimenez, uh, in actually engaging in a reconstruction uh, to reconcile the Greek and the Latin traditions. Uh, and that's the position he came to. And, and I think what we see is this consistent learned opinion throughout history being used. And so I, I don't think it's only on them because Cardinal Kajayadan, uh, what, he, what he says in his uh, treaties as well, is that he freed us from the reproach of the Hebrews who blamed us for framing books or parts of book on the ancient canon, which are absolutely without. So he's not only going on Jerome's opinion, but he's empirically looking at what has come down from the Jews and making the determination on that as well. All right, guys. So the time is out. Actually, uh, okay, there we are. Okay, so now we will be moving into 30-minute uh, question and answer session. So I'm going to actually start with uh, one of the super chats uh, we received early on. 
Yeah, Super Chats have some precedence, but don't worry, we get to all the questions um, as fast as we can. Let me first set the time, because we will need to do 30 minutes of this. Um, and the first one isn't actually a question. Let me just display it. It's a Super Chat. That's those, are the, says, those are the best questions. <laughs> yeah. I love you, Trent Horn, uh, from a friend of mine, Richard. Uh, uh, my sure. answer would be, uh, I am flattered, happily <laughs> married indeed, but always, always appreciative of um, uh, support. And uh, I hope our commenters, though, will show um, similar support uh, to Jonathan as well, because oh, yeah. it's, it's quite interesting in uh, the discussion that we're having here. Uh, I mean, I would find with Jonathan far more common ground theologically than I had, for example, with uh, Steve Christie, who I previously debated on the Old Testament canon, who is probably the furthest away theologically for me one could get with uh, reformed, low church theology versus uh, Jonathan's more um, high church Anglicanism. All right. So uh, now another one that I want us to display is kind of a question. It wasn't framed as a question, but it is. And I think it primarily addresses uh, Jonathan, but uh, I think both of you will get. And the way this works is that the person to whom the question is directed will have two minutes to answer. And then, you know, if the other person has thoughts one minute and probably equal time if it's to no one in particular. Okay, here is from um, Father James. He's an Anglican priest who goes by Barely Protestant. He wants to simply note, and again, probably ask your thoughts, um, that the Book of Homilies, a part of our Anglican formularies, explicitly cite the Deuterocanon as scripture. So what are your thoughts on that, Jonathan? And uh, then Trent, if you have any. Um, you know, I think initially when we look at Article 6, uh, which specifically defines uh, how we understand uh, Deuterocanonical uh, books in the Western Church and their use within the polity of the Anglican Communion, uh, I, I think squares very well. Uh, you know, in many ways, they, they are treated as canon in sense, or uh, they are part of the received tradition of the uh, the Apostolic Western Church. So in that way, we do receive it. We do account it canonical on that status, uh, but we make a distinction and we do quote Jerome on there. So I think when we read the homilies, uh, which uh, is designed to read to the people, and Article 6 specifically says these documents should be read for the edification, I do think that squares pretty well with Article 6 and... Uh, uh, 35. I, I would have to get where sp specifically um, there the homilies, which are mostly written uh, by uh, Kramer, and there were some others as well. Um, I mean, they drew up these articles. So, uh, so I believe the uh, so I mean, I think he's given second book of homilies, homily 11, and homily of alms deeds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the one he's given us. I, and I believe I, I read that, which is a really good one. Um, and, and this may go back to Trent's point, and maybe Trent can help me understand where he sees that Article 6 and er, Article 35, or since we are advocating for it to be read to the congregations and treated as scripture in that sense, where's the, the discrepancy between that? Sure. Um... Let me see if I can bring. Um... Well, it, I, it's because the, the 35th article uh, says that the second book of homilies uh, contain godly and wholesome doctrine necessary for these times, uh, as doth the former book of homilies. So it talks about the them containing this godly and wholesome doctrine. Yet in many cases, in order to confirm that doctrine, it uses the the deuterocanonical books uh, and does so in a fashion different than what um, the sixth article says one should not do. I just think that that's interesting. It's just kind of a, a contradiction. I think it, it reveals that the deuterocanon had an entrenched place within Christendom that Protestantism had to really rip and tear away from. Uh, and we can see this, for example, in the fact that... Um, uh, Protestant Bibles, like you look at the 1611 King James Version, it cross-references Matthew 27 and Wisdom 2, uh, you know, citing a deuterocanonical book as a part of that biblical prophecy in the 1611 King James Version. 
Uh, but then later, and so the Deuterocanonical books are there in the KJV and in, in most in Anglican Bibles and others. But then when you get to the 19th century, you have a lot of Protestant uh, Bible societies getting rid of the Deuterocanon out of the Bible, not even as an appendix. And yet things like the KJV footnotes still remain, but they point to a book that's no longer there. In fact, I think it was the Edinburgh Bible Society in Scotland that said that they would not include the Deuterocanon, even as a non-inspired appendix in the Bible, uh, because they were worried that that would lead people to uh, Romanism, essentially. Yeah, I, I would frame it in the context of just how we use Jude. Uh, obviously, we don't accept uh, Enoch, uh, but we do accept uh, Jude. So we, um, we recognize it is quoting other literature, just as Paul quoted the pagans. Um, and obviously, uh, there's a number of allusions uh, in the New Testament Gospels, which probably wouldn't doubt does go back to that. So they were using literature of this period. The Jews still use a number of this literature. Uh, but I, I don't think in, in the same way that Jude doesn't canonize uh, Enoch, in the same way the homilies uh, in referencing these documents are not canonizing uh, the Deuterocanonical uh, books. All right. Um, so this is a question for Trent from Dan Chapa, another great guy I'm proud to call a friend. Uh, for Trent, granting some exceptions, do you disagree that the Hebrews generally agreed on the canon by the time of Christ? Well, let me see. Well, the, the question has loaded an important phrase in there, granting some exceptions. So, uh, but, I, but I think that that is the crux and, and what, is, what is important. Uh, I believe that just as there were Judaisms, uh, in the Second Temple Judaism at the time of Christ, uh, we also found canons. And I think that that is really the opinion that comes to when you look at scholarly research on things, uh, as I cited earlier, Timothy Lamb's book, The Formation of the Jewish Canon, Timothy Michael Law's Handbook on the Septuagint, uh, Lee Martin uh, McDonald's work uh, on the canon, Volume 1, The Old Testament, all show this kind of gradual approach to understanding that ends up revealing different... I think all that we could say with, with the time of the Jews in the first century, everybody agreed on the Torah, the Pentateuch. They all agreed on the, fi the first five books are a gold standard. That's no wonder then that Philo, the Jewish Alexandrian philosopher, when he cites scripture, like 98% of his citations are the Torah, not the pro Deuterocanon. He doesn't cite the Deuterocanon, but he also doesn't cite many of the prophets or the writings. That the Torah was the baseline, and then from there, after you get dis you get a substantial disagreement between the Sadducees, the Essenes, uh, even after the Torah about the status uh, of Esther, of Song of Songs, uh, <coughs> of, of, these, of many of these other works. So no, I, I don't think there was this kind of uniformity. That would make sense, by the way, of why when Jesus engages the Sadducees on the question of the resurrection, he does not cite a prophet like Daniel, even though he does cite Daniel before the Sanhedrin in his own defense. He doesn't cite Daniel on the resurrection where the doctrine is quite explicit. Rather, he cites the, the, the Torah, he cites the book of Exodus, because this was a, a book, the first five or something that all Jews held in common. So I, I would disagree with the question. I don't think that there was uh, there was there. I don't think there was a uniform canon, at least not one like the Protestant canon that's being uh, defended here. And do you want to add anything to Jonathan, or is that fine? Well, I I, I think I understand the observations that Trent is making. I, I think first. Uh, the understanding of uh, the Sadducees we get from Josephus' Antiquities. Uh, you know, they admit no observance at all apart from the laws. And I think this is where um, the assumption is built that they didn't accept, um, <clears throat> you know, though anything outside the Torah. Um, it's not specifically stated, and I still have to read this in the ream of you know other uh statements from josephus where he does when he's specifically speaking about the uh the canonical tradition of the jews 
Um, he doesn't pre preclude them there, uh, but uh, wraps his uh, mind around the idea that this is to receive uh, tradition of the Jews. Um, so I, and I think we have to read that in context. So I, um, as Trent brought up, you know, before the Sanhedrin, um, you know, discussion happens a little further. Uh, but I, I would still say we, we would have to still sort of reconcile both statements from Josephus. I, I can see where that statement from Josephus that they admit no observance at all apart from the laws. But um, is this referring to maybe more of their oral traditions as opposed to uh, the prophets, uh, which are bringing different messages? Uh, than uh, their Torah tradition. So, so you're saying in this case, Josephus might be <clears throat> imprecise or exaggerating when it comes to the Sadducees. Uh, no, I, I would probably say that uh, it's not as definitive or clear. Imprecise. Um, yeah. What he means by they emit no observance at all apart from the laws. Does that preclude them recognizing the prophets? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's difficult to read that interpretation. All right, uh, Trent, this is from you, from another guy who is a very good friend of mine, Steve Christie. And he wants to ask a question for Trent. Can you name one Jewish or Christian list, I guess a list of books, identical to the Catholic Old Testament canon prior to the 5th century, like you can for Protestant canon from the 2nd and 3rd centuries? And he cites uh, B. Bathra and Origen, I guess. So that's the question. Yeah, I would say that uh, the lists that are proposed at the councils of Hippo and Carthage are the same lists that are reaffirmed at Florence and Trent. Uh, there is a bit of a dispute about the content of the book of Esdras, what that means. Uh, so some people like Steve have tried to argue that the canons are different. Uh, but Esdras is not a distinct book of the Bible itself. It's primarily uh, copies of what is in Ezra, Nehemiah and Chronicles. Uh, so when we understand like how St. Augustine understood, you know, there's like technically four books of Esdras, E-S-D-R-A-S, that become uh, a little complicated to sort through what each one is. Uh, but we understand them in their proper context. Uh, I think it's clear that the, the canon that is received at the fourth century councils, as well as the canon that Pope, I want to say it was Pope Leo, uh, he, was, he gave in a, a letter to... To, to, uh, at Toulouse to Exuperius, I believe, uh, would be the same canon that was reaffirmed at the Ecumenical Council of Trent. Uh, so I would place that there. But but even Athanasius's canon in the fourth century, uh, it does not. Uh, its Old Testament canon does not match um, the Protestant canon uh, as yeah. well. There are differences there. But I do believe what comes from the regional councils is reaffirmed at Trent. All right, great. Uh, do you want to say anything on that, Jonathan, or is that fine? No, I, no, I, I, right. I think that's pretty fine. Uh, another one from Steve Christie for you again. Uh, Trent, hypothetically, if some Eastern Orthodox uh, books uh, could be added to the Catholic canon later, isn't the Catholic canon missing inspired books, uh, I guess, now? Okay. Yeah, so this just once again goes to a, a hypothetical. Yeah, so this is a hypothetical question. Uh what do we do if the Eastern Orthodox chose to, to reunite with the Western Church, the, which I would love, by the way, and I love for the Anglicans to come back too. I mean, you know, of the three groups, we're all we're a lot closer. I'm much more. It's way more likely I can get Jonathan to come on board than Steve <laughs> at this point when it comes to our our, our doctrinal differences. Um, and we, well, frankly, uh, Jonathan, if you're ever in town, I'd be happy to take you to the Anglican Ordinariate in Dallas. By the way, uh, oh, definitely. Ever uh, ever stop by? Um, uh, that would be the the Catholic liturgy that has preserved um, many of the Anglican, much of the Anglican form. Uh, so once again, this, and this is hypothetical. It could just be the case. It could all. It could also be the case that if the Eastern Orthodox were brought into communion with Rome, it may also be the case that they would have to accept that the sacred writings for them, like Psalm one fifty one, others that are not in the Deuterocanon. Uh, only have the status of permissible, but they are not <clears throat> divine revelation. That one could read them. Uh, they're safe to read. They would have a kind of secondary canonical. They, they would become deuterocanonical almost in a sense, or quasi. So we don't know. So it's possible that the canon would remain the way it is, 
And these books would never be fully incorporated into it. So if someone's concern is that, well, the Catholic canon could add books to it and I can't countenance that, that might not happen. I don't know. It's anyone who speculates on church history, it's very hard to make these kind of future judgments. On that. Uh, but it's also possible that these books would be preserved and it would just be the case, not that they were missing inspired books per se, but that the church had not formally recognized them until, let's say, the year 2400. Uh, much the same way that the church, uh, the formal recognition of these books did not take place in, in a conciliar way until the, the fourth century. It doesn't mean that, that Catholics did not recognize them as inspired scripture prior to 382 or the end of the fourth century, just like Christians recognized the Trinity, even though it wasn't formally defined until Nicaea in 325. So all that would prove is if the books were rec that they were recognized later, not that they weren't inspired, it would just show that they had just been preserved in a particular uh, time and place. Uh, but as I said, it's a more of an interesting hypothetical question. Uh, all right, uh, Jonathan, you're fine with that? Yeah, no, I, I think it goes back to the question I asked uh, right. Trent earlier on this. Yeah, probably that's where you got him. Okay, another one from Trent. <clears throat> Trent is a bit of a superstar. <laughs> okay. Oh, by the way, uh, before that, I want to say that um, uh, Steve Christie wants to tell you that he loves you, Trent, and he wants you to work on your Australian accent. Uh, I think you're having a sit down with another friend of mine, uh, Paul, who goes by the other Paul. So great channel, guys. Definitely check I it will, out. I will, do my, I will do my best. I think I've given... I've tried my best to do the Australian, you know. Good eye, good eye, good eye, good eye. If I could just start with that, maybe I think I've oh, actually I think some of the strains have said that's kind of awesome. You're, you're you're picking that up from Matt Fred. Good eye, light. All right. So we got another question. Right. Yeah, this is from Father James. He's an Anglican priest. Goes by Barely Protestant. This is for you, Trent. In your view, does the Magisterium determine the canon? or infallibly recognize the canon. Uh, sorry if this was already addressed in the debate. It wasn't, actually. But even if it was, that's fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with asking mm -hmm. that. Question. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, what I would say is that there are two views that I believe would mischaracterize the church's role in its relationship to the canon of Scripture. Uh, so one mistaken view would be that the, the church determines what is canonical the word canon comes from a greek word that means rule okay so you know it's the, the rule of faith what is this something we believe in? of course canon isn't just bible we have things like the canon of of star wars what is canonical star wars what is non-canonical like uh, i believe that the endor holocaust should be canonical star wars maybe it's not that could be a debate i'm willing to have another debate on that with Endor Holocaust deniers at a, at a future point here. Look it up on Wikipedia if you don't know what yeah, I'm talking Yeah, I deny about. that, by the way. Yeah, well, you know, there's all there's always the the the, the Endorian bigots out there, who the, the anti-Ewokians and their bigotry. But in any case, uh, it doesn't determine in the sense of that, the, that we have these writings and the church makes a decree and some become scripture and others do not. Uh, God determines which books are inspired and thus become the rule of faith for Christians by inspiring them. So God determines the canon. Of, he determines what constitutes written revelation by choosing which human authors to uh, inspire to write his sacred text. So the church, God determines it, not the church. However, that does not imply the other view, which would be that the church merely discovers the canon. It is not the case that uh, the church's role in the canon is that the church kind of fumbled about in the dark, so to speak, and went through a certain kind of purely human process of discovering which books are inspired or which are not, which would be summarized by the, the late Protestant author R.C. Sproul, who said that the canon is a fallible list of infallible books. So those would be the two extremes. It's not determines canon. It's not discovers canon. It's declares canon in the middle, authoritatively. So when the church chooses to resolve an issue related to something like the canon, a dispute among Christians, the church is able to authoritatively declare, at the very least, these particular books, which would include the deuterocanon, protocanon, deuterocanon, are inspired scripture, and Christians are not free to reject them. And 
the church speaks with the authority given to the apostles, what you bind in heaven, it, bind on earth is bound in heaven, etc. So there I would say it does not determine. God does that. It does not discover through human means. It authoritatively declares by virtue of, of the magisterial teaching office, the charism of teaching that comes from the apostles. All right. Uh, do you want to say anything on that, John? Yeah, the, the only thing, and it's probably just more of a clarification, uh, in the Council of Carthage in 419, uh, one of the statements that they end with in Canon 24 in Scripture is that uh, we were... Uh, you know, these are the writings which we have received uh, to be read in the churches. So I, um, I, I think there's a little bit of a distinction, and I know where barely Protestant is going at. Uh, we receive uh, the tradition, um, and, and and maybe this is a subtle point, but we can see that it's both Catholic and Apostolic, and I think this is why I brought up Irenaeus is. He made that empirical observation looking at the churches of the apostles and seeing the self-same tradition that had come down by the succession of bishops. And he was able to recognize empirically what God had revealed to its churches, which are its uh, true guardians and witnesses. Yeah, and I would just say the declaration is not arbitrary. It is rooted in the apostolic tradition. <clears throat> So now here's a question for you. Uh, I can't find it to display it, but I remember it quite well. So this is for Jonathan, which is, why do you think that the four major codices all contain uh, the Apocrypha or the Deuterocanonicals? And for those that don't know, the four codices, as we know, are the most ancient Bibles, not the, just the manuscripts, but actual Bibles that are put together, Christian Bibles, not Jewish ones. And they're, you know, as we all know, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, uh, Ephraimi, and... Um, Alexandrinus. So these are 4th, 5th century manuscripts, the oldest Bibles we have. So Jonathan, the question is, I think it was from Tom, I, I can't remember, uh, why do you believe they all contain or contained the Apocrypha? Well, the, uh, I, I, I think it's important to understand they, they come from the Greek line, and we know that there was a lot of influence in these writings. I mean, even among the Greeks, it was just so exciting to see how, uh, you know, this small group of Jews were able to take uh, over the Macedonian uh, army uh, from the Secludians. So I, I think it was, you know, to more of a surprise, uh, we see some of the Hellenistic uh, philosophy coming into them. And, you know, as, as far as myself, you know, what, what I understand, uh, even given, you know, some of the church fathers understanding of how, the Septuagint or the Greek Old Testament tradition came about. I, I think there's some differences. You know, if I look at Josephus, Philo, and the Talmud, they say Ptolemy II only did the Old Testament, or, or not Old uh, just did the Torah. And we see with the letter of Aristus and Augustine and others that the version of the 70 did the whole. But I think the byproduct of the Hellenistic period is you had these other writings uh, from the Jewish histories that came in, and were of value in that period. I mean, there was a number of uh, Hellenistic uh, Jews that did enjoy these writings. So they come in in the Greek tradition. So in the Greek tradition, we are going to find these. I, I, but I, I do think, so this is what we should expect to find because it's part of that tradition. Uh, I think the bigger question is, why don't we see it in the, in the Hebrew tradition or their canonical tradition? Uh, from that case. But yeah, we would expect it. But uh, with those codices, there are differences. So even if we look at the ancient codices, there are differences. So looking at just those four uh, manuscript traditions, it indicates what Jerome, Origen, Augustine all realized. These traditions are all over the place. You can get, yeah, they contain that tradition, but the books are different, so you don't get a definitive answer on which one is correct from four different uh, Greek manuscript traditions. All right. Friend. Yeah, and I and I would just offer my thought that it's true they are different in regards to the Deuterocanon, uh, but they're also different in regards to the proto-canonical books of the mm -hmm. Old Testament. Uh, so Codex uh, Vaticanus, for example, from the early 4th century, uh, doesn't have Timothy, Titus, or Philemon. Mm -hmm. uh, Sinaiticus uh, is missing parts of the Pentateuch and Joshua and Samuel. 
so, you know, we, we also see that as well, but they all, it's correct. They do contain the deuterocanonical books. And I don't think that can be chopped to do, oh, well, it just comes from the, the Greek Septuagint tradition. Uh, I believe the problem here is that, yes, that is the important tradition, uh, but we've been given no reason to see why it should not be trusted, given its overwhelming citation in the New Testament, as I showed earlier. Uh, also, you also have, even as late as the Council of Trent, like you'll have some Protestants say, oh, well, the, the clergy at Trent didn't really know Hebrew. And that's not true. Like Francisco Ferreira, who was a, uh, one of the fathers at Trent, had written a commentary on Isaiah based on the, the Hebrew Masoretic text. Uh, so we have throughout history people who were aware of Hebrew, uh, aside from Jerome, uh, who did not uh, reject the Deuterocanon as a result. Okay, uh, now here's another question for Trent. We're back to Trent <laughs> quickly. <laughs> right, um, Steve Christie again wants to ask, since Paul is speaking in the past tense, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God, doesn't this mean the Jews knew what the canon was prior to Paul's epistle? Right. And I would say that what Paul is talking about here is that he's not making a discussion. The, the topic, it's always important when we exegete a text to ask, what is the main topic that is being discussed? And the issue in Romans 3 is not about uh, whether uh, the can it's not about the canon of Scripture. It's not about the whether Jews possess the fullness of, of divine revelation, whether they were missing parts of divine revelation. Uh, that is not uh, what Paul is discussing in Romans chapter three. He's using the aorist, uh, so a, a completed past tense, doesn't always mean that, but I would say it does mean that in this sense, to talk about an action that had happened in the past, like how God appeared to Moses under the form of a burning bush. That didn't happen to the Gentiles. Uh, God appeared to Moses and he gave them the law and Leviticus makes it clear, you know, you shall not lie with a man as with a, a woman. Whereas so in whereas in Romans one, uh, Paul says the pagans can be held accountable for things like homosexual conduct because you can know from reason that that's wrong. But then he adds in, in Romans three, hey, the Jews, we even get divine revelation as being very clear about this. However, I think as I've made it clear in this debate and in my writings and in other scholarship of Judaism, uh, I would just be very careful as a Protestant to say, well, I'm just going to have the Jewish canon because we don't have a uniform Jewish canon until the second century after the Bar Kokhba revolt. Uh, because at that point, the Sadducees are defunct because of the destruction of the temple. The Essenes have been uh, eliminated, essentially. All you have left are rabbinic Judaism under the Pharisees and Jewish Christians, uh, because Christ told the, the, the Christians to flee to the mountains when, when the time comes, flee, flee to the east or flee to the mountain when the destruction comes. And so we see the divergence here where we have rabbinic Judaism having the truncated version, as I quoted from other Jewish scholars, possibly to cut off Jewish Christian apologetic and the Jewish Christians preserving uh, the, the deuterocanonical books. But prior to that point, first century and going back, there's far too much divergence. The, the, the empirical evidence shows far more divergence on these points. There is a uniform. It could be that what Paul's referring to is the uniform belief in the Torah. Yeah, they all agreed on that. But where the canonical boundary ends, way, way messier. All right. Uh, are you fine with that, Jonathan? Yeah. I, the only point that I'll just make is that we know the Jews were uh, dispersed throughout the known world. Um, and I, I think what we see coming down and even within the Pharisees, uh, there was the house of Shammai and the house of Hiel. So, um, did they really have one standard on things? Uh, not really. They couldn't get over, uh, which way to wash your hands. Uh, and they, were they willing to just accept, uh, a, a broad view on the, on the canon? So I, I would say they would have had to know they've had different traditions, the Babylonian, Talmud to Jerusalem. Uh, I, I would say it's consistent from uh, the sources that we have. It seems that this is the tradition that they brought down with them that has been consistent. But. All right. 
So I'll take three more questions because we have a lot, but I can't get to all of them uh, in time. And uh, we've already been going for two hours. So I'll take three more. Um, just a quick note, uh, Steve Christie wanted to let Trent know that uh, Last Jedi he does not recognize as canonical. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I personally am a, uh, a, a Jedi for contest. So I do not believe that anything after... Uh, Return of the Jedi is canonical. I'm possibly willing to make an exception for Rogue One that that would, would be have deutero canonical status. <laughs> All right, that's great. Okay, um, so this is a follow up actually to a question Trent already answered uh, from Father James. Um, he wanted to tell you, well, I mean, he asked you a question Does the church itself establish the canon or just infallibly recognizes? I think your answer was more. It infallibly recognizes, and he says, if it is so, if it infallibly recognizes the canon, wouldn't that mean that it would have to be from the material sufficiency of the scriptures? You know what is so funny? Uh, I saw a clip about this uh, because I was just perusing YouTube instead of studying before uh, this came up. I, I saw a clip related to this discussion on uh, other Paul highlights. So I believe uh, other Paul is another um, Protestant apologist who, though he comes from more of a low church tradition, he and barely Protestant and I will be dialoguing soon. Right, yeah. And they were having a discussion about this point. And I thought it was an interesting argument. And I'd like to process it more before I give a complete reply. The argument they were making is this, is that if you believe in the material sufficiency of scripture, which would be, and there's two different views. One could be that all doctrine necessary for salvation is found in scripture, even implicitly, or that all doctrine, all Christian doctrine is implicitly found in scripture. Catholics, can, that's one view of material sufficiency. Catholics may hold that view, but they do not have to hold that view. And the argument that they're making is that uh, in, if it were, the, if that is the case, then would that mean the canon of scripture is implicitly found in scripture? And so that would support, uh, Protestantism. Uh, and so I, I'll tie it back to the, the question here is if it infallibly recognizes the canon, would that mean it would have to be from the material sufficiency of the scriptures? No, it may not. Because if you hold the, another view, which is called the partim partim view, which is that divine revelation is found partly in scripture and partly in tradition, the canon itself may be something that exists in tradition that is neither implicit nor explicit in scripture. Uh, and so the horn of dilemma they tried to put in the video clip I watched, and I have to think through their argument more to give my full response, is that, well, if you do material, that 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 proves at least material sufficiency. I'm not sure that it does that. Uh, so I, I don't think that that is... Um, at least not a robust material sufficiency, like that all doctrine is there, maybe related to salvation, but not necessarily um, to the full limits of the canon or anything like that. Uh, but uh, so that's one problem with it. But, so the, the argument here uh, could mean, uh, so it could be that the canon, the church declares the canon and it is material sufficient. It's found mm -hmm. implicitly in scripture, but I don't think that would help Protestantism because one may still have a problem of explicitly bringing it out in an authoritative way where you need the magisterium to be able to do that. That would be one. Or two, a Catholic might take another approach and just say, deny the material sufficiency premise and say uh, that revelation comes partly in scripture and partly in tradition. I have not fully made up my mind on this particular question. I'm open to both views. The part and part view seems interesting because I think that there are beliefs like that divine revelation ended with the death of the last apostle, the last apostolic man that are not implicit in scripture. And yet we, we hold to them uh, infallibly, you know, infallibly. Uh, even if we were to include the Eastern Orthodox uh, works back into scripture later on, it would be because they have an apostolic origin. We would never include the Book of Mormon, for example, that was written in 1830, Golden plates aside, a discussion for another time. So, in any case, that was a long answer, but it was a thoughtful question, and that's I'll and I'll hopefully have a more comprehensive reply in future time. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, are you fine with that? Yeah, the, the only thing you know from the the, the Anglican perspective, you know, we, we recognize obviously Scripture first, uh, then tradition and reason. Um, so, I mean, tradition is a part. And I would say in the canon specifically. 
that's a tradition that has been at all times and all places. Uh, we see the canon. So there, there's a much more objective framework. And the way we uh, state it in the Anglican uh, um, articles is the commonly received texts are canonical. So it, it's a much more objective definition. Uh, and it obviously takes in consideration the tradition or the Greek, Latin, and Aramaic apostolic churches' traditions in there. So, all right. Um, now, this is a question from Sid. Um, and uh, this is his summary of it. Basically, if the Catholic canon is the historical and apostolic canon, how do we rationalize the differences between the Orthodox Church, which also has a valid apostolic succession, and I guess between uh, Catholics? <laughs> all right. Yeah, and I would just say um, that that particular question might be more of a sociological and historical question dealing with uh, kind of the the slow folding divorce that occurred in uh, the early church after the fall of Rome, uh, where you have the division between the Western and Eastern Empire and lack of communication between the two uh, different customs, culture, language, and liturgical traditions. Uh, arising as a result, even though there is still a mutual Catholic faith and a recognition of, of a universal jurisdiction of the Bishop of Rome, we see very diverging um, customs emerging. And part of that may have also included the venerating of certain Old Testament texts. So we see this in just differences between how the Cappadocian fathers approach theology versus those in the Ambrosian and Augustinian tradition. So it's a bit broad of a question to explain exactly why that is the case, but I don't think the fact that it is the case um, counts against uh, the authority uh, of, of uh, the Catholic Church, at least um, in that respect. There, you just might, you know, there's there are different options one would have to take that the Orthodox may have been mistaken in accepting these books. That's one approach, or you might take another. Of course, if you're Orthodox, you could say the Catholics are wrong about not including them, uh, or you know, you could take which would be the the other approach saying that uh, they should have been recognized earlier, but specifically the Council of Trent did not deny these books were scripture. It passed over them in silence is the Latin term that is used. So which would still allow their formal recognition um, later. So yeah, I guess a few thoughts on that. All right, Jonathan, you good with this? Yeah, I, I still come down to the point where, where, uh, two or three witnesses agree. Uh, that's where we would have. Right, yeah. uh, but but I would have the Jews in that uh, uh, point of authority as well. So yeah, that's all. okay. So now this is for Jonathan. It was clarified by Examine Truth, and he wants to just correct a little bit uh, the question a little bit. I'm gonna read the correct uh, version. I'm going to read the corrected version. Uh, without the normative authority, for you, Jonathan, without the normative authority, isn't it troubling that if you reject a book of scripture that God wants to be scripture, you're uh, truncating your data set and you may be distorting your doctrine as a result? Without the authority. Um, well, I, I, I would say the authority lies uh, with the independent witnesses. So, um, and I think this is why it's not dependent on any one sole jurisdiction, but we look at the different uh, relevant witnesses, part of this uh, tradition in making the decision. And I think this is what uh, prevents us from actually rejecting a, uh, a book. Obviously, there's many things as part of the Western church we agree with. Uh, but I, I, I think we still have to bring this around to include uh, the other witnesses. I, I think what we're doing here, um, if we're leaving it within the, the sole authority of the, the Western church, maybe we're taking a blurred vision because we're not bringing in, uh, you know, the Greek Orthodox or to that sense, uh, you know, the Aramaic churches who are also witnesses. And this is why I think uh, this needs to be a representative decision from not only uh, the Greek, Latin, and Aramaic apostolic churches, but the Jews as well. So I, I think uh, looking at it just from the lens of the Western church, even though I'm predisposed to, uh, to our bias, um, I, I think we got to 
take off the glasses and uh, start looking at the other witnesses as well. And Trent, are you fine with that? Well, yeah, and I would say that when we examine witnesses to something like the Old Testament canon, uh, not all of not all of the witnesses are of equal evidential value. Uh, much the same as when we say, well, how do we understand the uh, the identity of Jesus of Nazareth? Who is he? There are a variety of witnesses. There would be Jewish prophetic witnesses before Christ. Uh, there would be uh, the witnesses contemporaneous with Christ, like the apostles, and then those after, like the church fathers or uh, rabbinic Judaism. And of all of those witnesses, rabbinic Judaism is the least helpful. And it, it only indirectly attests to things like the virgin birth through its uh, mockery and calumny of Christ. Much the same way when I try to determine the Old Testament canon, I look at what did, what is the Jewish testimony prior to Christ? The opposite, how did the apostles view the Septuagint? How is it used in the New Testament? How do the church fathers use it? And then finally, rabbinic Judaism afterwards how it views it, but it's going to have far, far lower evidential status because of its break uh, from Second Temple Judaism. All right. Now we are moving into closing statements. So we will have five minutes for both sides to offer closing statements, perhaps uh, reminisce or just sum up the case for us. Okay. So Jonathan, wherever you're ready, uh, we're going to start with you. Five minutes. Okay. Uh, Give me one moment. Um, not that I forgot about it. I'm just uh, <laughs> right. going through my notes here. Okay. Uh, once again, uh, thank you, uh, Trent, for this conversation. W- once again, I, I, uh, given our, uh, um, you know, kind of familiarity with the, the Western tradition, um, uh, are, are definitely uh, having the, the same or same basic polity or coming from the same tradition. I, I really appreciated this engagement. I think, uh, once again, th- there's a lot more uh, that probably unites us than divides us on this issue. And there's a number of things that we recognize um, as part of our tradition that made this to be a much more fruitful discussion uh, that uh, I've probably seen in some of the evangelical community. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, it was it was so refreshing. Uh, someone of your caliber being very familiar with the the writings of the fathers and being able to engage their literature uh, in a respectful forum. So, um, w- with that said, um, I, I I think it's important. You know, when we look at the historical evidence, and obviously I frame this in light of the Jewish uh, testimonies. I think in accordance with uh, August, uh, Augustine's formula, I, I do believe greater weight uh, would be assigned uh, to a number of independent Jewish communities. And, and I think one of the points that I recognize is when we look throughout the known world, this is the text that they come down with. And I have to determine, uh, was collusion... Uh, the result of this uniformity that we see in the Jewish canonical tradition. Was there any member of their rabbinic tradition that would have had the ability to standardize a specific canon across the various factions of Jews that still existed at that time? Um, And if there was an attempt, why don't we see that hundreds of years later. Why, when we look at the um, uh, church fathers in both the Greek, Latin, and Aramaic uh, apostolic churches, and see that they too did recognize a uniformity within the Jews. It was something that they recognized uh, that was a major difference to the text they have today. And I think one of the simplest explanations that we can make for this is that the Apocrypha, that is the the writings that were the product of the Hellenistic period uh, that had come into the cat or come into the period after the Jewish canon had closed, just weren't received by the Jewish synagogues. Because I have to explain why Judith, which is very consistent with their liturgy of, uh, you know, keeping kosher and not mixing with the Gentile nations, or the book of 
uh, Maccabees that is completely ingrained into uh, Jewish society uh, does not end up in canon. And I think the simplest explanation for that is the canon was already closed. They believed that the spirit had already withdrawn, even though there was a divine vor still present with the Jews. And I think when we weigh the testimony, uh, we do have to factor in that uh, the apostolic churches were the byproduct of a very divergent Greek manuscript tradition. And if we want to have a much more cleaner assessment of this question, we, we have to go back to the Jews and make a comparison of what they've come down, taking part any differences that they may have. So while I do recognize the issues raised throughout the history of the churches with respect to the Apocrypha were complex at times, uh, appeared uncertain in terms of canonicity, I think what I brought forward today and uh, trying to at least uh, um, bring over to Trent is that I think we do see a consistent learned opinion in the statements of the fathers where that there is this consistency on making a clear distinction between ecclesiastical use and the writings that we're going to consider as part of uh, the basis of our Christian doctrine uh on there and with that uh thank you uh trent for this opportunity thank you canadian catholic uh for hosting this uh, all right thank you so much just call me josh yes <laughs> all right so um trent we begin five minutes whenever you are ready yeah, once again, I'm really grateful that, uh, Josh, you invited us both here and Jonathan to be able to engage you on this subject. Um, it, it is always fun to have substantive discussion, and I think that's what we were able to accomplish today. And I would definitely encourage anyone who wants to learn more about this subject uh, to, to, yes, to go and do more of the research. So two, uh, two sources that I would, well, I'll save the sources till the end, actually. So they're fresh in your mind. You should go go do your own reading. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say I agree with Jonathan. Yeah, let's what 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 are the Jewish sources? What do they say? And what I've tried to do in this debate is to say that uh, the Deuterocanon. My favorite Bible verse is Sirach two four through six. Except whatever befalls you in crushing misfortune, be patient. For in fire gold is tested, and worthy men put in the crucible of humiliation. Trust in God, make straight your ways, and hope in him. I love that verse, and I believe that it's not just uh, a nice Jewish proverb, but it is the word of God. And I find solace in that it is the word of God. And seeing that also in Wisdom too, it's prophecy of Christ, uh, uh, the book of the Maccabees recording sacred scripture, all of this. And so if someone says to me, that's not scripture, I'm going to ask them, why should I believe you? Why should I believe that? Where is your evidence for that claim? And Jonathan presented evidence, but I don't think it was very compelling evidence. Uh, I think he admitted that the church fathers, the people we should go to, aside from Jerome, who, as I showed, had an idiosyncratic view, an incorrect view of the Hebrew manuscript tradition, they accepted uh, the Deuterocanonical books and specifically cited them as scripture. Jonathan said, well, we should go back to uh, the Jews. And I said once, and as I said, uh, what rabbinic Judaism says doesn't carry much weight with me because they rejected the Jewish Messiah. Uh, but I do agree we can go back to the Jews. Uh, I might go back to the author of Hebrews, a Jewish Christian uh, writing to encourage other Jews of his time uh, to not return to the temple, which was probably still standing. I think Hebrews was written around in the 50s. And what's interesting here, and this wasn't disputed in our discussion, uh, but I showed that that Hebrews cites uh, Second Maccabees as not secular history, but as sacred history. So it views this book, uh, views these books as belonging to inspired scripture. And it's interesting, Jerome himself uh, said to Rufinus, uh, as one of his arguments for the Hebrew manuscript tradition over the Septuagint, show that there is anything in the New Testament which comes from the Septuagint, but is not found in the Hebrew, and our controversy is at an end. Well, I can put it at an end, as I referenced earlier in the debate. Hebrews 10, 5 through 7 uses the Septuagint version of Psalm 40 as a prophecy of Christ, and the Hebrew Masoretic text misses the line, a body you prepared for me, and talking about the Messiah, which is something I referenced earlier in the debate. 
so for me, when I look at all of, of the testimony and the witnesses, there is not the fact that Jews later, after the rabbinic during the rabbinic period, after the time of Bar Kokhba, rejected the Deuterocanon. And we know this because, as I mentioned in the debate, uh, the rabbis in the Talmud had to give explicit instructions that the book of Sirach and the other Deuterocanonical books are withdrawn. Uh, just like the New Testament and Gospels, they said, do not defile the hands. They had to instruct fellow Jews that the New Testament and the Deuterocanon are not scripture, which imply that the canon, far from being closed, was still open and that Jews at that time recognized it as such. And so I'm not convinced by the evidence Jonathan has presented to warrant I or Orthodox Christians or others abandon the Deutero uh, canonical books, though I do appreciate the respect with which he proposed this. And in fact, I think it's very telling that even in our discussion, I think it's very clear the first Christians to embrace the exact canon he proposed, which rejects the Deutero canonicals and the extra portions of Daniel and Esther, is long after the apostolic period. Because as I showed, Jerome followed the authority of the churches on Deutero Daniel. Rather, we don't find that until the Protestant Reformation. And even there, you have Anglican and Protestant witnesses who were not ready to give up the Deutero canon because it was an entrenched part of the Christian tradition. So I'd recommend my, my, my advice to you. You want to go deeper in this book on this subject for a, a Protestant view on this issue? I would recommend Steve Christie's book, Why Are Protestant Bibles Smaller? For a Catholic view, I would recommend Gary Machuda's book, why Catholic Bibles are bigger. So that's easy to remember. Read them both. Read Steve's book, Why Catholic Bibles Are Smaller. Read Gary's book, Why Catholic Bibles Are Bigger. And make up your mind. So, all right, thanks. That was actually right on time. And I want to, first of all, thank both of you so much for making this happen. Um, and you guys are amazing. And again, uh, Jonathan, I've known for, um, you know, some time now, actually. And he was mm -hmm. um, actually, when my channel was still developing, he was actually one of the first ones. Before you go, I want to bring something to your attention. And I, I want to hear both of your thoughts, just a brief one, which is something I've observed. And I don't mean people like Jonathan or High Church Anglicans, but it has been my observation that many people who style themselves as Protestants only pay lip service to the idea that Apocrypha, while not being scriptures, still in high, held in high regard. Because I've heard, for example, them argue that it's contradictory, folk tale, teaches heresy, so on and so forth. But they will still pay the lip service to this idea that, oh, no, 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 it's still very useful. It's just not scripture. Do you guys notice this at all? Yeah, I, and, and I think it's uh, the byproduct of a number of, I, I hate to say, fundamentalist movement. Because I, 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 I think what happens is, you know, when we look at the Reformation, uh, there is a sort of break with the sacred traditions. And I think... Uh, uh, from the Roman Catholic or Western point of view, I, I think this is probably not a healthy uh, perspective or the direction that we wanted to go. And I think to some sense, uh, the Catholics, even Luther, they were uh, they were fearful. Of, this is what may start to happen. And uh, obviously, uh, the Anglican uh, uh, tradition, you know, and uh, Hooker was a big defender of maintaining the polity, despite of what we may have saw as abuses uh, within the Roman Catholic tradition that we would still hold. And part of that is recognizing that the tradition to receive the Deuterocanonical books in the Western and right. Eastern churches should still be received. But uh, and I think Trent brought this up about this movement in the 19th century, which I don't know if it's uh, a byproduct of what they saw as, you know, this forceful, dogmatic uh, position, maybe from Rome, on to canonize or accept these books that made them take a sort of Athanasian position to here I stand, you know, I'm not going to do anything else. Uh, but there has been a large movement within the evangelical uh, community that further separates themselves uh, from the sacred tradition. I mean, um, I mean, as Trent, you know, mentioned, uh, I, I felt it was important to have this conversation with uh, Gavin on apostolic succession, because I think this is another part where they're breaking their anchor from history. Um, and when they do that with the Deuterocanonical books, they're doing the same thing. They're, they're separating themselves uh, away from the history of the church and they have no anchor. So what do they have after that? Right. And, um, 
Well, what's what's interesting, it, it's so fascinating to me, uh, the deuterocanonical books that, you know, after the Reformation, they for centuries, they are still printed within uh, Bibles, in Protestant Bibles. Uh, you still find them even today, in the I think, in the Anglican books of, of common prayer and lectionaries, you know, you still... Uh, where I believe the root of the uh, opposition to them really in the 19th century, it I think it comes mostly from uh, Puritans who felt that the, the Anglican church had not shed its uh, popish Romanist uh, her uh, heritage enough. And so the Puritans were the ones who were behind this and especially zeroed in on the deuterocanonical books. As, and that's where we see a lot of them in different Bible societies pushing for them to not even be in the Bible at all. And another factor that seems to have played in the 19th century of the Deuterocanon disappearing from the Bible, not, not even because it was for a long time, at least in an appendix, disappearing entirely, was you had Bible societies wanting to print Bibles to give away to others and to mass produce them. And by eliminating the Deuterocanon, it becomes cheaper to produce these Bibles. And so there was also in the 19th century, not just from Puritan theology, but from a, there was a financial motivation for Bible printers to remove the books to make it cheaper to, to produce the Bible. Yeah, that, that, that was very fascinating when I discovered that. And actually, this is the fascinating part. I was brought up in a non denominational, unchurched kind of family, like nothing, not really, you would say, connected with any historical church. And it's interesting because we actually viewed it in a historical sense. We didn't know about confessions or, I mean, at least we didn't read them or anything, but we actually did view the Apocrypha as, it's not inspired, but it's still very profitable and we would have Bible studies around. But anyways, I'm not going to hold you guys up, um, you know, because I've already uh, taken you guys hostage for two and a half hours. All right, Trent, thanks so much. Sure. I just found it, it's so, it was so surprising to find out you're a Jedi Vacantist. <laughs> that was very interesting. All right. You yeah. should write a lot more about that. <laughs> one of these, one of these days, of, uh, for sure. Okay. Um, and thank you, Jonathan, again, both of you wonderful, wonderful people. Guys, go ahead and support their work. I don't know if Trent has a Patreon. Uh, do you have a Patreon? Yeah, people can support my work at yes. TrentHornPodcast.com. So just TrentHornPodcast.com. Yeah, and definitely, guys, it's worth your money. Very, very awesome discussions. Even if you're an atheist, good philosophical topics, so you don't want to miss them. Sometimes even reverse debates where Trent argues your position. So, again, And definitely. then this, this weekend, uh, people can tune in at the... If you live in Houston, by the way, you can go to the Capturing Christian... Go to CapturingChristianity.com. Right, yeah. I'll be at the exchange, and uh, I'll be dialoguing with Alex O'Connor, the cosmic skeptic. Uh, that's actually fun. I wasn't, I was just going to go to the exchange as a guest and have fun, but the oh. Christian, the Protestant debater, the Christian, uh, had a visa issue. So I'm going to hop in and dialogue, dialogue with Alex. That's the one where Joe Schmidt is going to be as well. Yes. And Joe will be there and Tom Ken. Holland himself. <laughs> that's funny. And, uh, will be hosted by Cam and Jonathan, yeah. uh, you know, go ahead and support his work as well. Great YouTube channel, great animation stuff. And I really like his novel takes on, um, you know, biblical texts. Many people have abandoned that, and Jonathan does a great job with that. So don't miss that opportunity again. I think he also has a Patreon. Just support it. Well worth your money. And, you know, he's a San Antonio Spurs fan as well, like me. So, you know, <laughs> All right. Thanks to both of you, and God bless both of you. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I am very, very uh, thankful to both of you. All right. God bless. All right. God bless. Thank and you now we have to say goodbye. All right. Uh, bye. And bye to you, Jonathan, as well. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks so much for uh, helping out with this and uh, being mostly civilized in the chat. <laughs> I think it turned out just well. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, you know, give chapters to it so it's easier for people to find. They just don't uh, have to, you know, do it themselves. Might be a little bit confusing sometimes. All right. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you later. Now we say goodbye.